The Donald Trump criminal trial continues today and uh, surprising no one, several jurors who are found to be fairly anti-Trump are being allowed on this case. I am a firm believer that there is not a single juror who will say not guilty to Donald Trump. Why? Because even if they think he is, they live in New York and they don't want to be the person who gets identified as being the person who let Trump go. So this should get interesting. There's already been a contempt motion filed against Trump. They want him fined. The judge is threatening to jail Trump for 30 days. So uh, suffice to say, it's getting spicy. And then we have the Supreme Court hearings where it looks like SCOTUS may be siding with the January 6th defendants over the obstruction charge, ragging on this uh, government lawyer who basically said that uh, if you pull a fire alarm to stop a vote, that's not obstruction. But if you are escorted through the building by cops, well, certainly that is. Now, of course, the uh, Solicitor General didn't say it exactly like that, but that's basically the gist of it. Supreme Court justice asked, what about pulling a fire alarm or coming into the court and shutting down the Supreme Court proceedings? And she said, well, we can't really prove they knew they were doing anything wrong if they did. So uh, we're not going to prosecute them. This will be interesting. We'll talk about that. Plus, uh, in New York, over 1,000 African migrants, mostly, I believe, criminal aliens, stormed City Hall trying to get into this hearing. And according to the New York Post, it was because they were promised by activists green cards and work permits. So, of course, many people are complaining. There's one story from a woman, a woman who says her kids couldn't play their soccer game because migrants had taken over the soccer field and the referee decided we can't do this and left. So we'll talk about all that before we do. My friends, head over to castbrew.com and buy coffee. Why? It's the best coffee you'll ever have. Appalachian Nights, of course, is everybody's favorite, and it looks like Re-Rise with Roberto Jr. is officially sold out. The promo is coming to a close. However, I do think there is a small batch that has not yet been produced and will be available. And of course, we're going to have the promo code at the end for Re-Rise when that does come out. Of course, we've got Rise with Roberto Jr., and I really do recommend to stand your grounds if you're a fan of Appalachian Nights. We got coffee pods and all the good stuff. Now you should buy Casper Coffee because the money we get from Casper, we're using to build physical locations. Our first location, of course, in Martinsburg, West Virginia, should be up in a couple of months. It is currently being built. And then after that, hopefully we have locations all over the country. And that's what we're doing when you buy a Casper coffee. But also don't forget, we're going to be launching once a month live shows on the uh, on the second floor at our club in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. And if you want to come, you got to be a member because these are private events. So go to TimCast.com, click join us, become a member. And then when we launch these once a month members only private shows, you will get emails and it's first come first serve. So we're not going to announce it on the show. We're not going to put it up on the website. It's going to be, I I think I, I take that back. It'll be announced, but first the tickets will be through the, through email. And then once we launch that, then we'll let everybody know when the event is happening. And the reason for this, it is a private event. Not open to the public. Got to be a member of TimCast.com. As a member, you'll get access to our uncensored members-only show tonight. We do it Monday through Thursday at 10 p.m., as well as access to our Discord server, which is a chat room, for those that aren't familiar, where you can hang out with like-minded individuals and talk to people about what's going on in the world. And I really do recommend that because uh, building a network, networking is how you win a culture war. So smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and so much more is Pulte. Thanks, man. Who are you? What do you do? I am the inventor, so-called, of Twitter philanthropy, which is now called ex-philanthropy. We help people I'm, with direct giving. I'm wearing the, the thing. Thank you for wearing I don't know it. this thing is called. <laughs> Giving away millions of dollars of my own money on Twitter. But most importantly, what we've done is raise millions of dollars on Twitter directly for people who are in immediate need and crisis. I also am very involved in the retail stock community, GameStop, et cetera, and also invest in great creators like Mr. Beast and many others, so. Happy right to be here. Thanks for Absolutely. having me. Absolutely. Thanks for hanging out. Hannah Claire's hanging out. Hey, I'm Hannah Claire Brummel. I'm a writer for scnr.com. That's Scanner News. I'm really happy to be a part of that team. Uh, and I'm so glad that Chris Carr, executive editor, is here. Happy to be back. Chris Carr, executive editor at scnr.com, filling in for the mystical Ian. Yeah, indeed. Uh, thanks, guys. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. Let's get to it. Here's the first story from the Daily Mail. Judge tears into Trump for intimidating jury after warning he could be jailed for disruptive behavior as juror is dismissed for posting lock him up on social media. Now, what I love about this is there are actually worse things than that. There are people who actually joined a, what is it, like a pro Biden parade or something like that. I've got some uh, some tweets to pull up and wokeness tweets. 
Judge Mershon rules that a juror who joined a Biden election victory parade is not disqualified off the jury against Trump. The reason? Because the juror claims she thought it was a celebration of essential workers. But there's more. Jesse Franklin Murdoch says kangaroo court. No Orthodox Jews allowed, but Trump derangement syndrome is no problem. In this post from Erica Orton, Judge Juan Merchant denied another attempt by the Trump lawyer Todd Blanche to dismiss a prospective juror over social media posts, one of which said Republicans projected to pick up 70 seats in prison. Blanche noted that both sides had, quote, a fair bit of uh, co- collo- colloquy uh, with the progr- uh, prospective juror. She said such things like she lost sleep last night over whether she could be fair or impartial. The judge denied an effort by Trump's lawyers to remove a prospective juror who shared social media posts that showed celebrations on the Upper West Side after Trump lost the 2020 election. The judge said he believed the prospective juror when she answered she could be impartial if she was selected for the panel. So here we go. Donald Trump is facing already contempt charges for alleged violations of the gag order. He's been threatened with 30 days in jail, and we have numerous instances where the jurors have a clear bias against Donald Trump. I do not see a scenario where a single juror will say not guilty. Because even if they think Trump is not guilty, not a single juror wants to be the person who has to be surrounded by New York Trump deranged liberals and 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 show themselves to be a Trump supporter. If if this jury says Trump is not guilty, their lives in New York are over. Far, I, I imagine they'll get attacked in the streets. They'll be kicked out of every club. They'll never be able to eat again. Do you see how many jurors they went through? They went through like 100 jurors <laughs> and God knows how many times half of them burned through. I don't know if you follow that one guy, but he's tweeting out about every juror that comes through. I mean, the craziest of things too with the people and how they've known about Trump and how they followed him forever. I, I don't see how he gets a fair shake. And and I I imagine if it comes down to all of the jurors and they can't get, get enough, the judge is going to say, I don't care. Clearly. I mean, the fact that uh, the judge has denied Trump the right to go to the Supreme Court now, now this is this is what everyone was talking about, that uh, Trump asked to go to Barron's graduation and the judge said, well, we'll see how things are moving along, but I'll I'll wait to see where we're at in the case before I decide if you can do it. Trump got pissed and was like, I can't even go to my son's graduation as an outrage. But that was the judge saying, we'll see. The judge literally said, you may not go to the Supreme Court oral arguments for presidential immunity. He said, yeah, I get it. That's important. But so is the New York Supreme Court. I think uh, as a former president, Donald Trump has a duty to this country to be at the Supreme Court during the oral arguments for presidential immunity. It is of utmost importance. And I'm of two minds on this one. I believe that uh, presidents are immune from criminal prosecution for actions they took while uh, uh, during the course of their official duties which certainly would fall under uh, what Trump was doing, especially considering he was uh, impeached over what happened on January 6th, but he was acquitted ultimately. So there is an element uh, of double jeopardy, I suppose. But, you know, I'm not going to cry too much if they rule that presidents don't have immunity. It's still no guarantee that Trump is actually convicted on any of these things. He was already acquitted once. We'll see. They'll probably load up a liberal jury in D.C. and then we'll convict him. And uh, but at the very least, I can say it opens the door to Barack Obama being criminally charged for the extrajudicial assassinations of Anwar al-Awlaki and his son, Abdurrahman al-Awlaki. Not that I really believe anyone would ever prosecute Barack Obama, but hey, please, fine. You want to open the door? We'll open the door. Well, he didn't offend the great bureaucratic state of New York, right? Like, that's what this is to me, New York bureaucratic arrogance, saying you can't go to the Supreme Court. You have to stay here. We are the center of the universe. And in fact, we want you to stay here so that we can make the media circus as bad as possible for you. There's no way Trump could get an impartial trial in in New York City. There's no way. And yet here we are going through this waste of taxpayer dollars saying, hey, 100 jurors, what do you guys think? Have you guys heard of this guy, Donald Trump? Like, You know that building you bought ice cream? cream at with his name on it. Have you heard about the ice skating rink? I mean, there are a lot of people (laughs) in New York who have fond memories of Trump who, you know, Mm -hmm. would have been sympathetic to him, who maybe have turned against him since he got got more involved in politics, right? But either way, it, it seems impossible to think that you know there was one juror that got dismissed who was like i would love to sur- serve on on the jury for the greatest president ever but my my job makes it impossible right so there are people who are like no i wow. want to be on trump's jury someone I, said that yeah someone said wow. that. Hmm. that i got this out of an nbc news, news report that the thing is 
that this guy is not going to be there. He yeah. has to he commit to his job. Or there was like a surgeon who got dismissed or there was a high school teacher who was like, no, I could not be impartial. Like some of them are self-selecting out. But what concerns me is the fact that this judge is like, Trump, you have to stay here. We are the most important thing in the world. And that there are going to be jurors who are like, yes, I could be impartial knowing full well that they have already right. decided that he's guilty. There was this one uh, case. I can't remember what it was. It might have been Kyle Rittenhouse. I'm not sure where uh, I think it was Rittenhouse. One of the jurors said, I do think I could be impartial for, for this case. But as a staunch advocate of the Second Amendment, I don't think it would be right. So and they're like, OK, you're excused. And every conservative on Twitter is just like, this is the problem. Mm -hmm. The honor and dignity of the right. I believe in the Constitution. Therefore, I can't do this. It would be unfair. What would fair be? Someone who doesn't like the Second Amendment being on these on these cases. So now you have I'm surprised to hear that. I didn't know that a juror who should say I can be impartial. You've got jurors who are like, I went and celebrated Biden's victory, but I'll be impartial and say, OK. And then a guy's like, he's the greatest president ever, ever. But, you know, I, I'll leave. But I think to your point, you know, all of them know it's a risk to be the juror that was that was leaning pro yeah. Trump. Right. And in this case, the guy said, I have a conflict with my job. So he probably felt more comfortable saying, I wish I could be on this jury. He knew he wasn't going to be able to go on, on, on the jury. He knew he was going to get excused for you know employment reasons. And so he felt like he needed to be like, I would like to be here for the greatest president. Like, it's interesting that only the people who know they're not going to be on may, might be open about that that type of support. Well, it sounded like this guy actually just needed to submit to his higher calling in this instance. I, mean, I don't know what his job situation is. I mean, it must be pretty bad if he wants to be on that jury, but he's not going to be able to. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'd like to think that there's somebody that's going to be the last of the 12 angry men in a room that's going to be like, no, actually, we're going to do this right and give him an impartial verdict. Yeah, it'd yeah. be nice. So is Trump in there all day? I mean, that's yeah. what it looks like. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty wild. Every, it is. Every, every yeah. day except for what, Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday? I mean, or, that's basically jail in and of itself. Yep. Yeah, that's that's part of the idea. Little if preview. I would, if I was Donald Trump, I would uh, I'd be at the Supreme Court. No question. I, th I believe that's what next Wednesday. I'm not sure. I think it's I think so. Next week, and yeah. let them throw no, you in maybe, jail. It's not not Wednesday. Would they? They can try. I mean, that's that's the headline, right? Do former President Donald Trump jailed for attending Supreme Court oral arguments on presidential immunity. His right. case. That that is precedent. This country needs the uh, like Donald Trump needs to actually challenge the corruption. If he does not, he is complicit to a certain degree. This this court case against Trump is fake. Everybody knows it's fake, and I mean that literally. Anybody saying otherwise is lying to you. The Krasensteins going all day and night. They're full of it. They'll 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 get you know they'll they'll sophist their way out of a or they'll try to out of a paper bag. This is. A misdemeanor uh, business filing charge that for no legitimate reason, the DA is up to a felony. Clearly fake. There's no underlying criminal action. The FEC and the DOJ both said what Trump did here is not a crime. So there's no charges. The state just wants to lock up Trump and stop him from campaigning. The only reason corrupt government can do this is because Trump agrees they can. That's really it. At a certain point, when a clown shows up to your doorstep with a clown warrant, you can't just comply with a group of clowns. So what would you do? Sit in Florida and then just say, OK, New York PD, oh, no. you got to come and arrest me? Well, uh, we talked about this with Atlanta. And depending on the circumstances, yes, 100 percent. I'd say you send your guys to, to my state because this at the time with uh, with Atlanta, it, it created a, a, some interesting circumstances. Ron DeSantis running for president. It would put Ron DeSantis in the position of having to comply with a state request from Georgia to Florida to go and get Trump. And if Ron DeSantis did, it'd be the end of his political career. He'd have to say, no, I will not file this paperwork. And then Trump could say, I've received no paperwork. Hmm. They, they can say whatever they want on TV, but if they don't, they don't come through a legal, the, the legal system, it's just meaningless words on TV. As for New York, I suppose the issue is Trump owns a, a lot of his uh, net worth is tied to New York. So he's concerned about that. If it were me, I would say, uh, with all due respect, Your Honor, I will be attending the Supreme Court oral arguments as this has tremendous consequences for this nation. And I mean that no disrespect for, uh, to the state, to your proceedings. And I believe my lawyers can more than sufficiently be here to to carry out uh, their duties. But I also have a duty to this country that cannot be ignored. And then I'd go and then I'd say, I'd call, call their bluff. I got to be honest, beyond that, I don't know. 
if I, I, I might be a little bit more brash than Trump, perhaps um, I don't know what Trump's legal strategies are, perhaps behind the scenes, he's thinking, look, I'm probably going to win in November. This becomes nothing. So let's just buy the time, take the press. It's putting his name on TV every single day. It makes him the number one subject. It's it's press you can't buy. That's probably what he's thinking. However, principally, if it were me, I might just be like, come and get me, you it, know. It does capitalize off the, the sense of distrust that a lot of Americans have in the judicial, judicial system right now, right? Like he's at jury selection, which means it's even more of a circus. And already a lot of Americans don't trust jury trials, right? They don't feel like the federal government or whatever government's going after them is doing it with good intentions. And the whole situation, especially with the Supreme Court, exemplifies the sort of tangled weave of court cases that Trump is now engaged in, right? He can't go to one case that he's involved in because another state said, no, you have to be here. Meanwhile, another part of New York is investigating him for something else and another part and over here in Atlanta, like this guy can't And I win. think if he doesn't participate, as I understood it from my lawyer in New York, they can revoke the bond as it relates to the Georgia case. So it's just and a why? mess. Like why would those two things be like? And I think for the American voter in some ways, just always hearing about it from the press in a way that makes you know, the press is attacking Trump. I think it would make the average American citizen more sympathetic to them, to him because it says this is a system that's trying to oppress you. And a lot of Americans feel that that's what the government's purpose is right now. They are trying. It's it's to oppress them. I, I actually I, I think Trump may have a, a civic duty to not attend the trial in New York and to just go home. And the reason being is that this is a corrupt DA with fault with fraudulent charges using the power of the state to go after a president, which for clearly political reasons. And I think Trump should give a press conference in Bedminster or probably better off Mar-a-Lago because Jersey would probably arrest him too. But uh, he should go to Florida and just say, there is no underlying crime until Bragg produces the underlying crime that upgrades business filing misdemeanors to a felony. I will not take this seriously. This is, this is it. The, the charge against Trump is that Michael Cohen was uh, paid off Stormy Daniels and that Trump lied about the payments to Michael Cohen on his filing, calling it a legal expenses retainer, which is falsifying documents, a misdemeanor. But it could be a felony if it was done in furtherance of another crime. Bragg has not revealed any underlying crimes. And the, the payments that Trump made, according to the FEC and DOJ, are not criminal actions. That being the case, I think Trump actually has a civic duty to say until there is a legitimate underlying crime that will, will justify the upgrade to a felony. This is a this is a circus and it's fake. And I, I, I don't care to waste my time with a clown show. The problem now that I see is that New York and, and Atlanta uh, and the federal government, for that matter, I mean, especially with January 6th, they're creating fake charges against people. I mean, the obstruction charge now at the Supreme Court is another great example of this. The, the uh, Charging the J6ers, particularly Jacob uh, Chansley, the Q shaman, with obstruction, despite the fact that what he did doesn't qualify, and this was even sussed out in court, in the Supreme Court hearing today, though they didn't get to it specifically, but literally even the... Uh, the, the, the premise from the solicitor general was that if you don't know what you're doing is wrong, it's not wrong. It's not obstruction. You have to know you are doing it. Well, Chancellor was escorted in by cops. So what we are seeing now is in all of these cases, fake charges against people. So long as Trump and the right comply with fake charges, it legitimizes them. Antifa doesn't do this. They don't show up. They, they say, screw you. Who are you? The example I've given multiple times the past couple of weeks, Proud Boys and Antifa fight in New York. Antifa gives a middle finger to the cops and leaves. Proud Boys shake the cops' hands and the cops turn them around and arrest them and put them in prison. The right keeps saying fraudulent charges are legitimate and then saying, I guess I'll go to jail now. And then they do. And the left just says, we don't think it's a real charge. And they go, okay. And then the left leaves. You've got apolitical criminal gangs taking over city streets across the country. Cops are like, I'm not going to arrest them because they don't listen to us anyway. Then the right says, don't worry, if you arrest me, I'll comply with everything you say. And they go, OK, you're under arrest. And they go, OK, thank you, officer. I'll go to jail now. I don't, I don't understand. Even the former president, when everybody knows this is bunk, is like, well, I guess I'll just act like it's legitimate. 
and make sure everyone in the world knows I am treating it seriously like it's a real charge. I think that's one of the the conflicts that maybe people get from their lawyers. I've known a lot of people to have really serious legal issues, especially even in, in the state of New York. And the first thing they get told, even if there are no charges, is uh, cooperate. You know, look like you're complying or look like you're you're not holding up whatever they're doing. So that way it doesn't look to a judge like you're the problem. And I think that advice is often bad because complying, especially with a judicial system like they have in New York, which is heavily biased, just means that you're letting them get information from you or or you're going along with their system just so that they can use it against you later. On January 20th, 2017, a hundred, uh, several hundred to a thousand plus far leftists rampaged through Washington, D.C. I remember that. I was there. Mm-hmm. Setting that fires. Was crazy. Yep. Smashing windows. Do you know what the outcome of that riot nothing, was? Nothing. Nothing happened to him, I bet. Oh, nothing. It's the opposite. They got paid out millions of dollars. Wow. The, the, the federal government paid far leftists and black clad violent arsonists got paid out something, to, I, I think, to the tune of a million plus dollars for uh, uh, the, for being wrongfully arrested or something. I hope they do that for the January 6th people who get exonerated. <laughs> the, the, the point here is. I, I see it all the time. We were, we were talking about it with uh, with Doug Mackey. I talked about it with the Stephen Crowder case when it comes to judges right now. Every cop and every judge, and I mean this somewhat in a general sense, obviously not literally all of them, they're just thinking in the back of their mind, what do I have to do to be able to go home, sit down in my recliner and watch the game? Conservatives comply every step of the way. So we're good there. The left never complies, burns things to the ground and beats people and shoots them and kills them in some instances. So what does that tell the judges, the prosecutors and the lawyers? On January 20th, 2017, when hundreds of far leftists were kettled by cops and arrested, and I was in this group that got arrested. I was there for like two hours before being released because I had a press pass and I'm not an idiot. Some other journalists were screaming in the face of cops spitting on them. I was standing off to the side waving my press pass being like, officers, please. So I ended up getting released without getting charged, but I was arrested. I was told I was arrested several times. These people were told to resist. They're, they're not, 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 on the, not physically on the ground. They were captured. They were surrounded. They said, go to jail, say nothing, tell them nothing, deny everything. Then our lawyers will come in and will delegitimize the whole process. The police had no way to actually charge any of the individuals because they were all wearing black hoodies and masks. And so the police said, okay, conspiracy to riot. You all shut up wearing the same thing to engage in this behavior. And the lawyers argued, my client just so happened to be wearing these clothes. You can't accuse him of a crime for wearing clothes. Prove he communicated this conspiracy. Now, the reality is it's a loose, passive conspiracy, right? These people know the tactic of black block. They don't need to tell each other to do it. So uh, a few of the people uh, pleaded guilty. Then eventually the rest were all released. Charges dropped. Then they sued and they were paid out. What does the right do? Complies instantly. Goes to jail and the machine beats the crap out of him. I just feel like if there is a legitimate case, certainly if you commit a crime, yeah, you know, you, 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 you go to you go to court, you get your lawyer, you argue it. Right now, what we're looking at with Trump is the D.A. waved a fake piece of paper. I can't stress this enough. Falsifying business records is not a felony. He said, it is because there's another crime here. And they said, what's the crime? I'm not telling you. Okay, well, then if you're not, then there's no, then this charge is fake. So you effectively have a guy dressed like a clown, waving a clown warrant. And could you- uh, And his Dunkin' Donuts, did you see him walking in this morning? That's right. Yeah. Looks like a mess. This is what I see. And this is what, this is the point that I've made several times. I mean, if a clown shut up to your door, knocked on the door and you opened it and he says, I have a clown warrant for your arrest. Would you comply? No. I don't know why Trump is. This is not a real, a real, a real warrant. The judge, his daughter, is uh, has Democrat clients fundraising off of this. Everybody knows what's going on. He's telling he's telling Trump he can't go to Supreme Court hearings. This is clearly political. And Trump is like, guess I'll just do what they tell me to do, and then limps on in, and then says this is political to travesty. I can't believe it's happening. It's like, well, at a certain point, the system either breaks or you bend the knee. My fear is if this system is allowed to persist as it is. Welcome to the communist revolution. You've lost. If Donald Trump, the former president, says these are false charges 
I refuse to subject myself to a charge that has no underlying crime and has been falsely presented. Take it up with the federal government and we'll file in federal court and challenge this. He's not even doing that. He's complying with every step of the way on all of these cases, by the way, every single one. And they're all bogus. Mm -hmm. Comply, comply, comply. Every time he gets sued over a bunk, uh, over a ridiculous 30 year uh, claim of rape. And he says, guess I'll show up for this one. Then they say you're guilty. And he's like, what? I can't believe this is happening to me. The, 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 what Donald Trump is saying to everyone in this country is the government can do it. They will do it. And you can do nothing about it. I think that makes him relatable to voters. Like I said, like people who live there, I mean, trust in the government is not high. And so if it can happen to Donald Trump, what keeps it from happening to you, right? If they can do this to him, what would they do to you? I, I can't say whether or not he should resist or not go, but I will say that I think it demonstrates a really effective image to voters that are saying, even Donald Trump, who was president, a billionaire, this you know well-known guy is having to do these things. I would not be able to even afford the defense that he can. So the concern I have is, Maybe Trump's playing the victim angle of the government is out to get me. Look how ridiculous this is. I am trying my best to comply and be reasonable. Vote for me. That's why. Maybe that's the right play. My concern, however, is that when I meet your run of the mill normie NPC out in the street, they go, yeah, but I mean, Trump, Trump's like he did. He was fraud with his business and now he's, he's in criminal court for it. And you're like, do you know what the trial's about? No, I don't know. I just heard that he committed like fraud and stuff. But didn't they do that with the Russia collusion thing? Mm -hmm. They did it with all the different impeachments. I mean, at some point, this guy is just the power of positive thinking, right? The eternal optimist. <laughs> and he just thinks that he is invincible. I mean, in any ways, he's shown that he can be. So at what point is it just he's like, oh, you know what? I've escaped everything else. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be positive, And God's going to help me. I mean... Which is also kind of the boomer mentality. I hadn't really thought about it until you guys started talking about it this way, but like that sort of um, willingness to go along with whatever uh, is thrown at you from the government or the system, belief in the court system. If you're yeah. being prosecuted, you have to show up. I mean, that's a that's a pretty boomer uh, way of viewing the world. So maybe, but also on the other hand, maybe he does see the free publicity angle to this. No, and I, he I, really has that positive energy and he thinks, who cares? I'm going to win. I don't know it's, if it's necessarily the boomer mentality. It's the conservative mentality. Mm. The, the example being the Proud Boys in New York. Antifa's agitating and attacking people. The Proud Boys get into a fight with them. And they and the Proud Boys go to the cops and say, the cops are our friends. And those guys went to prison for four years. And Antifa got no charges. This is this is what we consistently, we, we keep seeing it over and over again. I, I would argue that in uh, the case in New York with the Proud Boys is interesting. They certainly said stupid things on live stream, like they were laughing about getting into the fight. But you, you, you show up to your own private event to see a speech. It was Gavin McGinnis speaking. And far leftists surround the building, screaming at people, harassing them, and then putting on masks, threatening people. Yet you're the victim. When you're trying to leave and they're surrounding and, and they're on every street corner yelling at you. And then the Proud Boys are like, OK, I guess let's go. Like if we're going to leave and these guys are, are on every street corner, then it's either going through them or we're not leaving. Then they thought the police would be on their side. Then they went to prison. I think by now they must have gotten out. That was a while ago. I wonder what the update is on that. But we see that consistently where these uh, people on the right think that going to court is is going to get them uh, a victory. But I'll say it again. In my experience, it's simply the judge goes, whoever is going to break first is my fastest ticket out of this case. And so you could have a guy go into your house and steal your TV and then when the cops come and he's got your TV, he says, he sold it to me. Now, that's a civil matter. You guys got to go to civil court. And you're like, what? He stole my TV. Cops don't care. Whatever gets me out of here. Look at the squatters. Then you go to court and you say, your honor, he stole the TV. No, he didn't. Then the judge is only thinking, which one of these guys breaks first? Which one of them will say, I give up because then we can all leave. I got all these cases on the docket. I don't have time to deal with this. Which one? You, sir, shut up. You lost. You agree? Done. We can go home now. There was a couple times. So Chris is the executive editor. I talked to him pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. And there was a time, I don't know if you remember this, during the Fannie Willie, Willis hearings when they were trying to determine if she had, you know, incorrectly hired some, like her, mm -hmm. you know, boyfriend and mm -hmm. things like that, where we were watching a live stream in our, our separate offices. And I, I was like messaging him like, this judge obviously wants to leave. This judge <laughs> looks miserable. Uh, yeah. and, and it was just, you can tell. I mean, I think there is something to the fact that some judges are like, I don't want to be here. But there was that one judge. 
I can't remember his name now. Who like remember when they panned to him with the camera and he like smiled? Oh, like, Ingeron. He, Ingeron, yeah. like he was like he mm-hmm. was on a sitcom. Like there are some judges that he want this too media happy to be there, right? Uh, and that's a problem right. too. I like. Do you want the judge that wants to go home, or do you want the judge that's like, this is gonna make me a national star? I want the judge that understands the job and has some you know palpable level of discernment. In yeah, their that's blood, true. You know? I want the but, judge from the Kyle Rittenhouse trial who screamed, "Don't get brazen with me!" At the prosecution. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite lines of all times. Like there, there is something towards the judge's attitude. Uh, I'll Did never you see forget O'Keefe that. went to the judge's uh, gym. Did you see? Oh yeah, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was pretty funny. That was good. Look at look, Fonnie Wills is a really great example. There's clearly serious conflicts of interest and ethical issues at play, and the judge goes, "Well, but you know, I mean, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Just stop. It's like, just fix it, and we'll just keep going." It's like, can you really keep going if all this time there was an ethical problem? And, and even yeah. so, he essentially admitted at the end of the day that she's poisoned how this trial looks to the average person, to the public. You know, so but people think they didn't do anything about it. People think judges are these intelligent, smart arbiters of truth and justice. And I think the easiest way to explain it is, uh, imagine you and your your next door neighbor were fighting over a lawnmower. Go to the neighbor across the street and ask him to to adjudicate between the two of you. And you'll be like, what? My neighbor is just some guy. Congratulations. You now know what judges are. They're just some guy or lady. They don't know any better than anybody else. Sure, they, they have an understanding of the legal system, but justice is not an issue of the legal system. Procedure is. So Trump is clearly... This, any sane judge would be like, what? What's the underlying crime? And when the prosecutor says, it's a secret, he'd say, get out of my courtroom. Is it, what, are you, what are you doing? Now, what do you think the appeals court does? Uh, well, it depends. Um, it depends on the judge. If it's a if, it, if it's an Obama or Clinton appointed judge or something, they just say, nope, it's fine. Trump go to jail. If he did skip a day in court and he did get arrested, do we know how long he'd have to be in jail? Is it just like a nightly thing or... I, I don't know. I, I, don't I mean, know they're either. threatening him with 30 days. 30 days. Yeah. Also, how will all of this play into, I mean, Trump has said several times, I'm going to win New York. <laughs> like, yeah. To mm-hmm. be fair, they're saying it's keeping him from the campaign trail, but he's exactly in one of the states that he's sort of, what are the, in baseball, they like point to like where they're yeah. the ball or whatever. <laughs> like, yeah. this is Trump being in New York being like, and yeah. I'm here to campaign. Like, That's if, this is the, if I'm going to make this a national stage, I'm going to win the state, which is interesting. That's crazy. He's pulling a Babe Ruth from that he courtroom by Babe being in there. Ruth. Like, they think they're really slapping him on the, you know, on the wrist with this, but they're he's they're actually just making it so much worse for themselves. Well, think about it. He goes out there every day. He gets to command them a news yeah. conference. Remember, for the last many years, they've been yep. keeping him off the air. Yeah. Now they have yeah. no choice but to cover him. Right? There was a whole thing where they were ignoring him for years. Right after yeah. he was president. Now they, he's out there. He sets the pace for the day, and he's just running with it. That may be the strategy. They may have said, "Look, this is great. You're going to be the top news for every major outlet the entire time they do this." take it you can't buy that press it's going to save you heaps so they're talking about biden's raising all this money he's got so much more than trump trump doesn't need it he's on tv nonstop, 24 mm-hmm. 7 mm-hmm. and that's probably the strategy trump plays the victim that's why he comes out before and after he gets a statement and that's why they want to put him in jail for the gag order they're like we can't let him speak he's winning from this yeah so they're I, they're they, I don't know what they're going to try and do they're, they said they want a three thousand dollar fine for his posts on uh, truth social or whatever that's crazy to me. I think the whole idea that they're trying to keep him off the campaign trail with these, you know, basically legal handcuffs it is has always been crazy, but it really backfired when he, before way before the RNC, way earlier than anyone expected, just became the presumptive nominee, right? Mm-hmm. It was one thing when there were people competing with him, you know, maybe there would be a long shot campaign, probably not. But now everyone knows November is a rematch between him and Biden. And we're all sort of hanging out in the meantime, right? Like, <laughs> it's the Trump show. It literally is the Trump show yeah, again. Yeah, crazy. Let's jump to this next story from the AP. Supreme Court questions obstruction charges brought against January 6th rioters and Trump. This is great. Uh, we have this clip and Wokeness posted it. Supreme Court Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch? Gorsuch. Mm-hmm. Gorsuch nukes Joe Biden's DOJ over January 6th sentences. Gorsuch lists multiple cases of folks who obstructed a congressional proceeding without receiving a 20-year sentence. Let's uh, let's play the clip real quick. It's about two minutes long. If I might. Um, so so what what does that mean for the breadth of this statute? Um, would a sit-in that disrupts a trial or access to a federal courthouse qualify? Would a heckler in today's audience qualify or at the State of the Union address? Would 
pulling a fire alarm uh, uh, before a vote qualify for 20 years in federal prison? There are multiple elements of the statute that I think might not be satisfied by those hypotheticals, and it relates to the point I was going to make to the Chief Justice about the breadth of this statute. Uh, the, the kind of built-in limitations are the things that I think would potentially suggest that many of those things wouldn't be something the government could charge or prove as 1512c2 beyond a reasonable doubt, would include the fact that the actus reus does require obstruction, which we understand to be a meaningful interference. So that means that if you have some minor disruption or delay or some minimal Outbursts. Okay, we don't so, think it falls so within the my, my to outbursts begin with. require uh, uh, the court to, 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 to reconvene after after um, the, the proceeding has been brought back into line, or uh, the, the pulling of the fire alarm. The vote has to be rescheduled, or uh, the, the protest outside of a courthouse makes it inaccessible for a period of time. Are those all federal felonies subject to 20 years in prison? So with some of them, it would be necessary to show nexus. So with respect to the protest outside assume, the courthouse, we'd I have can, to show that, yes, they I were aiming I've at shown, the proceeding. I, yeah, they were trying to stop the proceeding. Yes, and then we'd also have to be able to prove that they acted corruptly, and this sets a stringent mens rea. It's not even just the mere intent to obstruct. We have to show that also, but we have to show that they had corrupt intent in acting in that way. We and went around that tree yesterday. I, I know. I, I, uh, I heard the argument yesterday, but... You know, I, I feel bad for this uh, Elizabeth Prelegar because she has to argue what is the stupidest position imaginable because it makes literally no sense. But she has to. It's her job. So she's trying. Bless her heart. She's trying. But uh, but then we have to prove it was done corruptly. It, it, they knew what they were doing is wrong. She is. Uh, what's, what's surprising to me is this would end leftist political organizing overnight. And so I'm actually... I'm of the mind, I'm like, oh, I actually want her to win this one. If she wins this, that means anytime Antifa protests in the street, anytime they show up and bang on the on, on a door of the building, 20 years in prison. Now, I really don't think that's good for this country. We do need free speech. But her argument is, if you, you have to, they have to prove you knowingly were trying, that, that you were intending to obstruct and that there was wrongdoing in it. OK, well, these leftist organizations have direct action meetings where they get together and they explain why you will be arrested because what you're doing is wrong. In which case her argument is meaningless. I, I, I really do think based on this, we're going to see the Supreme Court come out on the side of the J6ers. Many of the J6ers will likely have their charges dropped pertaining to obstruction. Jacob T Chansley is a good example. How could this man have known what he was doing is wrong if the police escorted him through the building? <laughs> To which he then said, thank you, officers, for allowing us mm -hmm. in the building. And from what I've heard from this uh, this day in court, they're citing his social media posts, right? They're saying he said this, that, and the other, that we should you know, stop the vote, do whatever. But I feel like that all comes to an end when you get there and the police are like, come on in. Like, then you're not disrupting anything. The police are letting you in. No matter what your intention was coming to D.C., the second you get there and police say, it's cool if you come in then you're just going in because the police said it was well, okay. Her, her standard is meaningless. Right. Corruptly. And what does that mean? She says it means wrongfully. But what? What does that mean? When when Gorsuch asks her, these protesters are intending to block the vote and shut it down. And she goes, yeah, but they may think they have a First Amendment right to do so. So because they think they have a right to do it, it's legal. That's a bold statement. I'm, I guarantee you, each and every one of those J6ers were screaming First Amendment right to a regis of grievances, believing they had a right to to go into a public building and contest the vote. So it's an interpretation of her. The government is basically arguing to the government, I mind you, which is hilarious, that they get to decide when they think you did something wrong. That's it. Have a nice day. Yeah, the government's arguing to itself about something that happened to it. It's very weird. <laughs> What's crazy is, you know, you guys grew up, I think you grew up in the 90s, 2000s, right? It's like, 90s. we never saw any of this stuff. Now it's like lawfare is warfare. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, this is just the new version of war. You know, we had war in Iraq. We had this kind of war. Now it's like on the homeland, but instead of domestic terrorism, it's like this, this lawfare. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. I, I see, you know, people like this uh, Prelegar, this Engaran, this Mershan. I mean, these are what I would describe as authoritarian, dangerous, malicious, and evil individuals. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have said that, you know, when I was a teenager, I, I, I would say that those, those, I believe it's fairly naive, but oh, there's no such thing as good and evil. There's competing interests. But actually, 
I don't think it was so naive. I think it was just the state of politics in 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 the 2000s and uh, and before. Democrats and, and Republicans would hang out with each other. Conservatives and liberals and family members would argue, but they'd get along and buy each other's presence. Now it's if you're a Trump supporter, you go to prison for the rest of your life. If you're a far leftist who firebombed a building, we'll let you pass. Mm -hmm. We're at the point now where the polarization is so extreme. She's literally arguing to the government. They have a right to imprison whoever they think did something wrong, whether it, it, it's she's her argument is literally if we don't like you, we lock you up. Have a nice day. That's it. The far left can shut down official proceedings. Bowman can pull the warning, the emergency signs off the door and pull the fire alarm and nothing. And you could bumble into a building with no barricades. The doors were opened by police. You can take a selfie with the cops who will smile. You can say, thank you, officer, for allowing me in. I think you're right. The right knows how to use power. Or excuse me, the left knows how to use power. Mm. The right does not use power. It refuses when we to. get power, yeah. what do we do? And I'm saying, you know, as a conservative, if you get power, what do you do? You just, like you're saying, you bow over and you take this. The left, they get in there and what do they do? They prosecute the <laughs> hell out of everyone. When are these AGs in any of these states going to stand up and prosecute as well? Mm -hmm. I don't this think it's going to stop until then. It's the craziest thing to me. I mean, I've met prosecutors and then I ask them, when are you going to charge Biden? And they're like, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm like, what do you mean you got a local DA in New York charging the former president, Trump? I, and it's clearly bunk. You're not going to try anything, literally nothing against Biden or anybody else. Fair point in that Biden is deeply unpopular. And so perhaps the strategy really is exactly what we're seeing. Republicans say, no, 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 let them do it. Let them do it. They're going to lose because of it. You don't think Trump actually wants it, though, do you? All these charges against him and whatnot? No, I think Trump would like to go to his son's graduation. But I also think that um, sooner or later, my fear is there is no alternative scenario other than no other no alternative circumstance other than Republicans start acting conservatives, not so, not so much Republicans, start acting like Antifa in that they no longer believe the government exists. I think what we're seeing right now with, especially with Elizabeth Prelegar's argument that, oh, the J6ers knew what they were doing is wrong, so we can lock them up. But the far leftists who firebombed buildings aren't being charged with this. I mean, that's insane. You can never figure out their intent. We have no idea what they were thinking. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit hyperbolic to be fair. They did arrest some of those people. But when it comes to, uh, you know, pulling a fire alarm, for instance, Bowman should have been immediately charged. No question. He took the emergency sign off the door and then pulled the fire alarm and took off. He didn't even try going through the door. His excuse made no sense. They are outright saying they're a cabal. They will go after the enemies of their mafia. And that's it. At a certain point, the right just says there is no government. There is just a mafia. The left realized this a long time ago. And now they are they are fighting with them physically in various parts of the country. And they have allies who are I, I think you got, you got two things with the, with the government, an unwillingness to go after the left because they can't win and willingness to work with them to a certain degree to try and earn their favor. It's like when uh, uh, in D.C. there was an anti-censorship protest by the right. Antifa showed up and attacked these guys that benefits the establishment in the deep state. So they're like, OK. The enemy of my enemy. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna let the left keep wreaking havoc on Trump supporters and his and and you know people who oppose our plans. Sooner or later, people on the right are gonna say, especially now with the charges against Trump that are baseless. There is no underlying crime. They're just gonna say this is not even a legal system. It's quite literally just dudes with guns telling you to get on your knees. At at a certain point, I guess I can put it this way. I, I make the joke about clowns. Fine. But let's just say a guy in a, a black hoodie and a mask shows up to your house with his buddies and they say, get out of your house, get on your knees. We're tying you up. We're putting you in the van. What does any security uh, uh, consultant tell you? Never go to the second location. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. When uh, when you are faced with kidnap, the number one thing they tell you is you must do everything in your power to stop them from being able to take you to the second location because that's when you die. You have a chance to actually resist before that happens. Now, don't take don't take my word for it. Talk to actual security consultants on that one. But what I see now with this case against Trump, these are people who do not have any legitimate legal grounds to arrest, detain or even try Donald Trump. Even on CNN, they were there was a judge saying that the judge should be recused over what his daughter's been doing. 
uh, it was apparently Caitlin Collins was talking to him. Yeah, how is that not relevant? It's all of it's relevant, and I think it's it's we're going to get to the point where people just you know look. Imagine a guy showed up to your house with a badge that said the National Development Control Facility of Excellence and and Prestige, and he claimed he was your he was the emperor of the region, and you were his his. The you question is, tell him to get the hell out of there. You would, right? Yeah. And so, this is what I think we're going to end up seeing now with everything they're doing. They've pushed so far; they're not operating within legal means anymore. Even the NYPD, who would execute it, is sitting there and loving Trump. It's pretty crazy the fact that they'd have to arrest him. They would do it in two seconds, and they would do it anyway. Exactly. Yeah, I think it's pretty optimistic to imagine a a point where conservatives basically have a delegitimate view of the government i don't i don't really see that happening i mean it isn't conserving something as important as government or something that conservatives perceive as being as important as government liberals too i guess isn't that something that they can't ever really let go of completely no it it, in a certain sense if a judge signed off on a warrant and they showed up to your house and said look i'm just doing my job i got a warrant conservatives would say well okay officer i i respect what you're doing but when the cop shows up to your house and says, we don't have a warrant, we don't need a warrant, there's no charges against you, you're going to get on your knees right now or else people are going to be like, okay, this is a shakedown. Mm. Sooner or later, it breaks. We've seen it a little bit when conservatives are stomping on the thin blue line flags because uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, the cops were abusing the right and letting Antifa wreak havoc. You, sooner or later, I, I think this lady has exposed the government massively. And I don't know if... Maybe maybe we'll never see the ramifications of this. Maybe the right will always just get on their knees and say, thank you, sir. May I have another? I don't know. Well, if Trump defied the judge's orders and he did actually go to the SCOTUS hearing or if he went to his son's graduation, that would that might be a moment where everybody would flip. If they saw him do it, I think maybe, that they and might. And, and I think the issue is Trump may be thinking, cold block in... Uh, New York jail does not sound comfortable. I think we did see a signal from the Supreme Court today that they are aware that the judicial system is essentially operating with a political bias. I mean, so one of the articles that we have up on Scanner right now is on Idaho, the court ruling that Idaho can continue to enforce its restrictions on um, gender intervention, like medical, whatever else. And the case was originally bought by families of two minors who said, well, if you ban uh, their access to hormones, they'll suffer a mental, you know, mental stress, mental issue. And a court ruled in their favor, went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court are what what the case came down to was this idea that the court had issued a universal injunction. They had said, uh, because these people brought a complaint against this part of the law, all of the law can't be enforced. And the state said, well, if we let these people, we make an exception, these minors can get their their hormones, can we enforce the ban on surgeries? And the court, you know, the headlines will tell you this is about uh, LGBTQ transgender policy for minors, but really it comes down to this idea that the court acknowledged that more and more uh, lower courts are issuing these universal injunctions as a way to uh, stop laws that people don't like. And again, that's not really how this is supposed to work, but there are activist groups who use, like you said, lawfare as warfare and are able to say, well, if we sue and we get a sympathetic judge, they'll stop this in its tracks and that reverses yep. anything that's done by the legislature. So we do know that the Supreme Court is starting to signal like the, one of the lines in it is like, as these universal injunction cases become more and more common, uh, we'll get more of these high profile cases challenging the law. Great point. Um, mm. And I, I just think it's interesting that, you know, there are a lot of issues, um, but I don't know that conservatives will ever say like, we're anti-government, right? But they might start to say the way our government operates right now is broken and mm. we cannot treat it like a, a functional, healthy government. Yeah, that's a good point. Oh, man. Speaking of which, functional, healthy government. Yeah, let's jump into this story. <laughs> From the New York Post, over 1,000 African migrants swarm New York City's city hall over supposedly falsely promised green cards. I wonder if they have images here. They do. Ashley St. Clair posted this on Twitter. You can see it here. Uh, 1,300, 250 of them got into uh, City Hall. They were, uh, uh, according to this uh, article, promised green cards and work permits. I look at this and uh, these are these are criminal aliens. The uh, reason we know that most of them, not all, but most of them are likely criminal aliens is that they were seeking green cards. So they are not here legally. Uh, Perhaps some of them may be on tourist visas. I don't know. 
I think the average American starts to look at this stuff and you have to realize, well, I shouldn't say it this way because I hope Donald Trump wins and I hope it's not the case. But I think many people may start to believe there is no government. The border is wide open. National Guard was attacked and they still allowed these people into the country. The federal government is trying with all of their might to bring in criminal aliens in defiance of the law of state law and federal law. What is the purpose of government of for and by the people? We have a constitution. The federal government is supposed to serve the people. It is supposed to be comprised of the people to protect us, to uh, help us maintain order. But it's supposed to be fairly weak. State law should uh, state government should be doing the same thing. What do we have now? The federal government is doing everything, everything in its power to destroy the fabric of this country and the lives of its constituents, the lives of the people who are supposedly making the government up. They allowed how many how many millions in the past few years was like they're saying seven, but it's probably higher. Those are the ones that we know about the encounters. You hear seven to ten, but it's it's seven to ten million non-citizens. Yeah, and that's the, that's what I'm also hearing. And the yeah. thing that I think, too, that's crazy about this is, Tim, is because, you know, my family founded a Fortune 500 home building company. And everybody always asks me, how are housing companies and how are all these houses so expensive these days? Well, partially it's because of all this immigration, in my opinion, because what happens is you have a lot of these lower income immigrants come into the country. They take up the housing stock. They take up the demand. They push up prices. I think this is also going to cause inflation with regard to housing. And to your point, when you don't enforce the laws and you allow people to come in, and I'm not saying one thing or the other, I'm just saying the facts of supply and demand are, if you have the same amount of supply or lower supply, which you have for housing, and you have greater demand, you're going to see also the cost of goods, in my opinion, go up in this country and continue to go up, specifically housing. This is something that uh, the uh, the immigration minister in New Zealand just talked about. You know, New Zealand is a very, very small country anyways, and they were actually talking about restricting legal immigration, restricting short term work visas. I'm looking at Chris because he had to tell my article. I'm like, remember when this happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and they were saying, you know, we can't just have and it, the number they were saying is like 170,000 people come to the country because we can't absorb them. Our economy can't handle it. We don't have the housing. The other thing that bothers me a lot about when we talk about migration is that the government uses migration as this way to say like, oh, look, it's solving all these problems that we are not willing to address. So one of the things that comes up a lot with birth rate is that the American birth rate is declining. There's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's cultural attitude. Some of it is that millennials are like, I can't afford this. Uh, But instead, you'll see these articles about um, birth rate declining, and then you'll have the same organization say, but don't worry because, you know, migration helps us. So we're not in crisis because rather than encouraging and helping American families have their own children, we're just bringing in new people who aren't from here and may not even be here legally. Like they act like this is a solution to problems when actually they could offer, you know, child tax care credits. They could do all kinds of things, but instead they're like, it's just easier for us to replace you. And that sounds horrible to me. Like that doesn't sound like a government that rallies around and behind its people. Well, yeah, they hate us. Yeah, they You're, hate us. They, they hate our guts. What? Your, uh, uh, your water, uh, your pipes in your city full of lead, your auto manufacturing is being stripped away from you. Jobs are collapsing. The value of the dollar is collapsing. Foreign wars that have nothing to do with the United States that you don't even understand. None of us really do. Can't buy a house. Can't buy a house, can't afford food. It's getting worse. And what does your government do for you? They allow millions of people to illegally enter the country, come to your communities, take over your public centers, demand from you. Here, I got a tweet for you. Maude Marin says, yesterday, my eldest son's soccer team could not play one of their scheduled games because migrants refused to leave the field the league had permits for. Even after the cops came and told them they needed to leave, Finally, the ref said it was too late for the game to start and left. Two teams of high school boys in uniform with their coaches present and a valid permit could not play a soccer match in New York City because our city has become lawless. Not the biggest issue or problem, but so ugly and so diminishing to the quality of life. Elon Musk responds, Mm -hmm. this will get much worse. It will. And so this is my fear. It's not so much that people on the right will start to believe there's no government. It's that the government has effectively fled like there's it's not even a question of whether you want to believe in the in the uh, in government or not it really just feels like there isn't one Mm -hmm. it's just biden's doing what he wants there you know i'll say it again the titanic has hit the iceberg 
and the powerful elites are pulling as much of the fine china as they can as they run to the lifeboats. There's a couple big stories. The price of gold is, is, has jumped uh, uh, quite a bit. I think what, like maybe like 400 bucks in the past few months. And uh, reports that ultra wealthy Americans have started purchasing passports in huge numbers, more than we've seen before. Well, I forgot what they're calling them, uh, but they're like emergency secondary passports for other countries because the fear is it's it's collapsing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of people like to buy their St. Kitts and Nevis passport. I think it costs. I don't know what it costs now, but I, I remember someone told me that they bought one for 50K back in the day. Mm. A lot of people are going El Salvador has a uh, 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 passports available for people who want to invest in the country. And a lot of people are buying passports, secondary citizenship, because they're they're watching what's happening here. And uh, the people with money, what are they doing? They're building bunkers. It's funny when I get these Instagram ads for these. Uh, have you seen them? The yeah, big yeah. underground bunkers. They're even doing it now on Fox News. Have you seen it? Not, oh, not the bunkers, but a lot of the food and mm-hmm. oh, all yeah, those yeah, kind yeah. of things. Yeah. yeah, I used to hear a lot of wealthy people talk about it. Now it's... Becoming no, it's everywhere. Mainstream, yeah. how, did, how does all this feel to you, though? Because you have a young family. I mean, so does, so does mm-hmm. our executive editor over there. Mm-hmm. Like, when you guys watch these videos, do you feel scared for your kids? Or do you feel, like, more empowered to do something about it? What's what's the impact? I feel more it? empowered to come on here, you know, <laughs> and, and do something about it. I mean, I love helping people online. And we help immigrants. We help everybody. But at some point, you have to stand up for yourself. And when you've got all of these people coming in, where, you know, these people on the screen, where are they all going to live? That's the problem. Yeah. They're living in shelters, and the hearing was on the the uh, treatment of the migrants at shelters. The stuff. So there, there, there's some behind the scenes stuff that hasn't been made public yet. Uh, that uh, some journalists are are working on that I can't say too much about. But let me just say that I think most people assume it's worse than we realize. That this is surface level news. But what's going on behind the scenes is probably substantially worse. I'm talking, you know, we got the reports out of Chicago of, of tuberculosis, of mumps. Yeah. During Occupy Wall Street, uh, several women were raped. And the occupiers told everyone, do not report this. We will take care of it. And they told the women who had been raped not to tell anybody, because if the press found out, it would hurt their cause. Take that into consideration when you see what's going on with, with this stuff and imagine what's going on in these cities and these shelters that they're not telling you about. Yeah, this is really dismaying. So I'd like to add an additional black pill on top of it um, because there was one piece of coverage today that I thought was just the perfect encapsulation of, uh, of this situation and where we're kind of at right now. It's uh, Savannah Hernandez. Did you guys see her video? Which, no. Okay, so she's on the ground in NYC today and uh, she saw a guy with, with a NYC employee badge on. And he looks around at City Hall and he goes, what's happening here? And she goes, well, these are all illegal immigrants. And he said, that's a mean thing to say. And she's like, wait, what, what do you mean? And he, he like ran away. <laughs> like that's all he had. Like you would think that footage like this and pictures like this would be sobering to anybody that has some scrap of a brain left. You know, it's funny. But it's someone, not. Someone tweeted something where Don't they were you think like, the majority of people though are uncomfortable with this? Well, I mean, th- this guy isn't. And he's not the only bozo in New York City that's he just is. that clueless. They're just scared. They're in a cult. If you speak out, you lose your job, you're fired. And so they're all just saying what they think needs to be said. Mm-hmm. So they'll say that till they die? Uh, uh, un- until they're told by the quote unquote right side of history. This is why when that, uh, that, that OnlyFans porn star said, I found God and I'm quitting. I'm like, good. I don't care if she's honest or not. Maybe she's grifting. But when normies decide, like porn stars decide, hey, the real grift is finding God and convincing. It reminds me of that South Park episode where Cartman's like, Christian music is the path towards getting a, a, a platinum record because Christians will buy whatever. <laughs> and and my point is, once grifters are like, the real money is here, then the culture shifts in that direction because they feel that is the right side of history. So that's a good sign. Somebody uh, tweeted something funny where they were like, you know, I'm really worried about what's going on. I've been feeling concerned about the country. And then the response from their friend was, you've been watching too much Tim Pool. And I thought it was funny, but the funny thing about it is it actually is more surprising to me that there are people who think nothing is wrong. They don't watch TikTok. How many viral TikToks are there of people being like, I can't pay my bills anymore. I can't afford to live. I can't feed my kids. Well, we see it on Twitter every day. Every Mm -hmm. single day. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are like, no, everything's fine. It's like, have you seen the cost of food? Have you seen the cost of rent? Have you seen the cost of homes? Like 
young people are living in cubicles and there are people who plug their ears, close their eyes, say, la, 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 stop listening to these podcasts. They're wrong. They're wrong. Everything's fine. Go touch grass. Go touch grass. It's like, bro, I went and touched grass and I met a bunch of people who were complaining they couldn't eat. That's what I, that's what I mm -hmm. find when I go outside. Those mm -hmm. soccer kids wanted to touch the grass, but they couldn't because <laughs> they weren't kind of allowed. Right. Well. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. So, so uh, you're seeing all that. Like, what do you, what do you see on, on X with people talking about their struggles? Well, we have 3 million, what I call teammates, which are followers. And across the 3 million people, basically people retweet when I say, Hey, do you need help with groceries? Do you need help with medicine, et cetera? And it kind of goes viral, Tim. And what happens is many days we get, you know, 30 to over a hundred thousand replies. What I've seen in the last, let's call it five years or so has been what started out was people needing help and people who wouldn't want free money, right? Who doesn't want free money? Everyone wants free money these days, but it's like, okay, now these days people, it's not even free money. Now it's people need to survive. And what you could used to buy for a meal for five or $10, now you need 20 or $30 to go do it. And so our ability to affect people and help people on Twitter is limited because our resources only go so far. And I think this is the, the quiet effect of inflation as you're seeing poverty become more mainstream. And, you know, they talk about the middle class. The middle class in many ways is so far gone, in my opinion, when you have to spend $20, $30 in order to afford a meal. Yeah. I, I think that does something. There was a video I saw a clip of Jay, uh, a woman saying that her son was asking her, like, when are you going to go to the store? And she was like, I have $90 right now. Like, it, it's a very stressful time for a lot of people. And I think it is interesting that you are seeing such engagement with the work that you're doing. People are wanting to help others, even though I'm sure they're also feeling you know, that financial burden. They are, yes. People come together and they donate and they chip in and, and that's been the viral exciting thing of it. But Tim, to answer your question, the last three, four years, it's just gotten worse and it's inflation, inflation, inflation. I mean, that to me, I think is going to be the biggest issue of this election or it should be because I think that immigration also causes that. Yeah, I do too. I think it's inflation, immigration, and uh, a sense of geopolitical instability that's really going to drive people to the borders. I mean, so much of what I see right now is the left saying abortion is the number one issue this year. You see, you know, AP has a permanent place on their website for like, here's abortion news. But when you talk to the average American voter, it's I need to pay my bills. I need, I want to try and buy a house one day. I don't want my relatives to be sent abroad to wars. I don't want to fight in, you know. I think about these things with these wars and stuff too, about this Ukraine thing. And even the Israeli conflict is you look at on Twitter, people are dying every day. They don't, they can't afford insulin. They can't afford a cancer treatment. I mean, one of the things we do with Twitter philanthropy, X philanthropy now is we pay for groceries for people who are going through chemo. I mean, people can't cool. afford to afford groceries. They have to be out of work when they have chemo. I mean, in my opinion, this is where the resources should be going. And unfortunately or fortunately, that's why we have to do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, to your point about, uh, you know, the abortion issue, we just sent our uh, field reporter, Alad, to a Trump rally in Pennsylvania. And he was talking to Trump supporters that were there and like he would bring up the abortion issue. And Jen, for the most part, they didn't really want to talk about it. Like there was one guy that was just like, I'm not an abortion guy. Look, our, our election was stolen. The next one is going to be stolen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, He's like, we have to stay on topic. <laughs> yeah. And like he would ask them follow up questions. And I just sensed a general kind of apathy toward that whole issue um, because yeah. there are more pressing issues that are really impacting people's day to day lives. Right. If, if you can't pay your medical bills and you can't pay it for groceries, you can't really talk about other things. These right? hypotheticals hypothetical mean nothing. and philosophical yeah. ethical debates, while there is a place for them, and you know, I know this abortion in particular is a, a important issue for a lot of conservatives. If you are struggling to make ends meet, you are needing to stop that issue first, mm -hmm. right? You need to yeah. triage where the biggest issue is, uh, yeah. which again, I think only works in Trump's favor this election cycle. I don't think it works in in um, Biden's favor. That's why, you know. Our, our beloved Vi Vice President Kamala Harris is not currently on an anti-inflation tour. She's on a national abortion speaking tour. That's absolutely wild. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> I, I it, it just seems like, and unfortunately, this was similar in 2019 and 2020. Moody's Analytics was giving Trump this amazing projection for, for a victory in 2020. And then COVID, and it made everything very different. Looking at what's going on right now, I think if you track uh, historical precedent, it would be insane to think Trump could lose with the uh, rate of inflation, with mass migration. These are huge issues people can't afford to eat. I mean, historically, we don't really have TikTok and Instagram and, and, and X. But now we're seeing these videos pop up all day, every day of people being like, I can't afford to live this way. What's going on? The only thing I can say, though, is why I don't know is that somehow every bellwether district went, by, uh, went for Trump, but Trump still lost.
the bellwethers that get it right every time. For some reason, Trump still ended up losing. It's very strange how that could happen. And so with that anomaly, I have to wonder what will happen this time around in November that Republicans are not prepared for. And they're probably not. Yeah, I feel like this year is only going to have more plot twists as we go on. And it's going to be a long road in November. It's going to be a long (laughs) road. And I I think, again, we... So one of Nikki Haley's, she gave that speech before she dropped out saying, I'm not going to drop out no matter what happens in South Carolina. Mm. Um, She, and to her credit, she dropped out after Super Tuesday. Um, She said, you know, if I left the race now, this would be the longest general election in American history. And Mm. I think in some ways that's to the American people's benefits. I always say it's because we should be pressing both leaders more intensely about um, who they're going to staff, like who's going to be the head of different agencies and who's going to be in the cabinet and stuff like that. Uh, But I also think it lets all of the issues simmer on a national stage in a little bit longer, right? Every time you go to the grocery store and it's more expensive, or I just saw the other day that um, car insurance was up by 26% nationally. Yeah. Like every mm-hmm. time you have to pay a bill as we drive towards the election, you have to think very seriously between, do I want the status quo, which is Joe Biden, mm-hmm. or do I want something else, which is Trump? Look, it's, it's fascinating to me that the Democratic Party outright says you should have less stuff. They are screaming in your face. There's too many people. You shouldn't have kids. You, there's too much pollution. There's too much carbon. You shouldn't be driving. And then Trump is of the party that says, drill, baby, drill. The craziest thing is on Twitter, sometimes I'll just test some things out there because I have this audience, as I said, that's 50% Democrats, 50% Republicans. Mm-hmm. And I'll tweet out something innocuous like, you know, it's great to have children or you should consider having children. And just the most vile tweets in the entire world. And I don't know what political ideology people are who are saying this. I have an idea. But, uh, yeah, strong guess. <laughs> but but I just can't believe how pissed people get when you just, and I say fairly innocent stuff oh, too. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you should just maybe have more kids. Having kids will make you happy. Kids are a great source of joy. And then all of a sudden they're like, well, isn't my Pilates class a source of joy or isn't yeah. my whatever? Mm-hmm. And it's like, I, don't think I didn't you say that. Those two things though, like different but I types even of say joy, that. my friend. It's that's nuts. true. You didn't say that. Uh, but people will attack you anyways for it, right? Yes. it's the, People are mentally hijacked these days. It's like that mm-hmm. guy you were showing earlier who was burning the Trump sign. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's another story that we have. So, uh, let, let, let's, oh, let's, sorry, let's, sorry. Let's, let's jump to it. Let's jump to it. I think no, uh, setting the news we have it right here. here. John Kane tweets, James D. White, the Trump sign arsonist, pled guilty to two counts of destruction of personal property this morning. He was sentenced to 12 months probation and 80 hours of community service. Uh, here's the video. And uh, I wonder if we can we can zoom in. Is there any sound? No sound. Oh, I gotta I gotta jump back. So here you go. For what reason? <laughs> <laughs> He's kicking a Trump sign. It says Trump won on it. And nothing happened to the sign. <laughs> And he's just kicking it. He really did a number on that one. I know and what it's I'm going like to do. And metal on it, too. <laughs> he shows up at night or at In his to... biker outfit. You got to love it, right? Look at this. It's, he <laughs> tries, to, fair, to, tries he... to move the flag. We Doesn't want to get charged with a non-hate crime. <laughs> he brings a lighter. He sets fire to a sign that says Trump won. And then he runs. He's on camera doing it. Great run. What was the purpose runner, of running? Biker. Why did he have to run? Right. He walked he, to it and then he ran. He knew I, he was doing something wrong. and He's a child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's a child in a man's body. And like a child, he ran off because he was guilty. Look at this. And then uh, didn't he like build it again? Oh, yeah. Look, yeah, look, look. He came back. He comes back again and does it. He only got probation for this. Look at this. The dude makes a sign again. He shows back up to burn it again. In his, <laughs> several months later. In his in his bike outfit. This is several months later? Yeah, because no. the other two were in August, right? And this one's in February. Was it August? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Wow. wow. So he burned the sign. Remarkable. The sign got forgot. And he just, like, we, we talked about this before. He, he kicks the sign and then leaves and he's brooding about it. So he comes back with a lighter. And then the sign gets repaired and he broods about it some more for several months. It comes back and does again. Like he, it's compulsive. He can't yeah. help it. That's how irritated and angry the sign makes it. It's a sign in a yard. Please Maybe calm down. Maybe he needs down. to go on a longer bike ride or something, you know? Seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not working. He needs to <laughs> maybe go to a therapist. Maybe he needs know? to take the biking outfit off for I one mean, night. Look, <laughs> what right. drives a grown man? 20 years ago, this is unthinkable. I think it's generational. I think... People need to understand um, 
I'll, I'll, let me give you this cartoon example, right? I, I can't remember what cartoon I was watching, but it's like a little kid and it was like some wacky magic show. It might have been like Fairly Odd Parents or something. And then he gets turned into an old person and his pants immediately shoot up to his elbows mm -hmm. or to his, to his armpits. This, the, the, the idea being that when you get old, you naturally just decide to pull your pants way up. No, it's because 50 years ago, people wore their pants much higher. Mm -hmm. Today, they still wear their pants much higher. Younger generations have different practices. So the idea now is we see like something is wrong with people. What's driving people insane? No, 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 no. You're mistaken. This guy was always insane. This, his generation 20 years ago, the reason we didn't see people doing this 20 years ago is because boomers were very different than this. Now you've got Gen Xers who are a very different generation raised with different values engaging in the, these behaviors. What do you think is going to happen when the jackass generation is old and angry about politics? And it's already starting to happen. Jess Margera won't shut up about Trump. I mean, this guy does, he does not like Donald Trump. And I'm like, you're the drummer from the, from the jackass videos. Like, why are you going on Twitter and screaming about Donald Trump? It's just th these generations it's crazy. are moving in, in, into political spaces. They're older. And what you'll get is this. So take a look at what millennials do. And now consider what they'll do when they're older, when they're the ones in charge of these institutions. Well, I'll say this. So I have this Twitter following, right? I was on the board of this Fortune 500 company, which is our family's company. It's a $20 billion company. One of the executives was running a whole network of fake accounts, Tim, on Twitter to attack me using other people's identities. Can you imagine that? Yes, this is all <laughs> true. Okay, He was fired from this Fortune 500 company for running all these fake accounts against me. My point being is this guy's however however old, right? 45, 50 years old, multimillionaire executive. It's just like this guy with, I mean, it's different. This guy's doing arson. This guy's coming up with fake accounts. What is creating people to just go and and do these crazy these crazy acts right now where they're hiding behind things or uh, going out and doing this thinking nobody's going to catch them and they're just totally mentally hijacked and this is happening everywhere. Everywhere it's happening. I, I don't think it was months apart. I think he put the wrong, February was wrong or something like that. He might. I can't, I remember when we talked about this initially and there's, there's maybe, maybe it's wrong. There's also like, I don't know where, where in the country this, there's no snow on the ground. The leaves look similar. Uh, but either way, yeah. he came back multiple days to be like. It was multiple days. He corrected uh, early on. He said that it was meant to okay. be August, not February. So still just like th this biker man. <laughs> I I don't think, but these are grown men. Who I'm supposed right. to take so seriously? My, my point no, is, thank I you. I don't think it's that Trump made them crazy. I think it's that they were raised in a country making them crazy, and now they're older, and we are seeing this, and it's shocking to us because we've never seen people this old. Look, when this guy was 17, I'm I'm sure he did a bunch of really dumb stuff, and they, his friends laughed about it. I'm sure they bought cans of shaving cream and sprayed it all over the place, jumped in shopping carts and pushed people down the stairs and, and were doing ridiculous things like that. Now he's an older guy and he's doing the exact same things he's likely always done. Mm -hmm. We are just shocked to see someone who's older doing it because when we were younger, older people did not do this. Well, and we can catch him digitally too. That's true, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, uh, we probably would have assumed it was some dumb kid. Right. Now we find it's a middle-aged guy or something like that. Right, and he does, I mean, this is a small point, but he does mo try to move the American flag. Like, he doesn't want to burn the flag that makes he's, him not like an Antifa type, right? He he has, there's a line he is willing to draw. It's just the Trump sign that it, it's so under his skin. He's not just going to kick it. He's not going to light it on fire once. He's going to continue to try to burn it down. And I think that does show a level of like, I mean, you got to hand it to him. He was persistent. He He did not want that sign to be in his neighborhood, I guess. I only see this getting worse. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I've talked about quite a bit is the polarization is not caused by Trump. The polarization is rooted in the generations. And so the reason why we saw in the 90s, when you look at the Pew research on the political alignment, Democrats and Republicans overlap because they did. Now you see the political alignment spreading. It's because younger people are polarized. And they're becoming more and more polarized based on the media they consume. When these 13 year olds in 10 years are 23, they will be voting and they are going to be as far left and as far right as possible. And that then we're going to be like, what's polarizing this country? No, 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 no. The country polarized a long time ago, starting with the younger generations. And then once they get older and start entering the voting block and start taking over industry, it becomes more and more apparent. 
and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You can well, do that's what it. I'm saying too, is it's taking over industry, not just politics. Right. And it's going to exacerbate to the point where the system can't sustain itself. You've got uh, uh, overt communists. How can you how can you run a run, run a country with that, that that's this, this divided? How can you uh, coexist with people who fundamentally believe in things that you think are evil and wrong? You know the the, the question I ask on the, uh, the abortion issue for people on the right: If you think abortion is murder, do you all would you act in defense of the baby about to be murdered? And most of them say no. But I wonder what happens when you have ideas like that hyperpolarize. And you get to the point where the next generations grow up and then you have 30 year olds who are substantially more polarized and they're engaging in behaviors that are considered to be abject evil. I mean, look at MAID, for instance, medical assistance and dying. I mean, you've got in Europe young women who are like, I'm bored. And the doctor says, we will kill you. Quite literally, a woman said, I don't know what I'm alive for and I have no purpose and I can't take it. So I just want to die. And the doctors are like, okay. I feel like something like that comes to the United States. You are going to have people on the right be like, no, that's genocide. And when that happens, then what? The left is arguing for the right to sterilize children. I mean, we're at that point in polarization where we are getting into dangerous territory. Yeah. Yeah. I think ultimately there comes a point where it's like we're stretching a rubber band, right? When it's pulled too far in different directions, either it snaps and you're, you have two separate things or you have to release it and it comes back together. It's not the same as it was before, but it doesn't have the same kind of tension. And I think America's culture is at a point where it could go either way. You could either see really serious divides among people or you see a point when, you know, the tension breaks and things come back towards the center. Uh, obviously, I think one of those probably would be more peaceful and nicer for people. I don't think people want to see the country dramatically shift and break apart. Um, but it does not seem like our culture can sustain the way it's going when yeah. it's actually pulling itself apart. Do you think as many people hate Trump as used to? I mean, I think no, that there's- I, don't. I, know, I know for a fact that's not the case anymore. You, you, you can see it now mm -hmm. when you go out to quote unquote touch grass. Agree. Mm -hmm. There are people who I, I've, I've met. Uh, there's one guy that I've been talking to who's like a Gen Z guy. And he's just like, I was a Democrat a few years ago. Now I'm probably going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, it's the immigration, man. Yep. Yeah, there are a couple of issues. And, and no one loves Biden, right? It's not like people really love Trump and some people are more neutral on him. Mm -hmm. But with Biden, they're like, well, this is what we have. Yeah, There's it's a team thing. Right. Yeah. They're they're voting Democrat. They're not voting team Biden, whereas people would vote for Trump if he ran as an independent. Right. People mm -hmm. are behind Trump 110 percent so right. much so that he really has changed the attitudes of the party. I think I think the RNC has gone through a lot of internal change because of his influence. The DNC is effectively the same and no one is out. I, I don't know anyone who's like Biden is the best. I would follow him to the end of the earth. They're more like. Well, he has the right letter at the end of the ticket. So it just feels like years ago, 50% of people hated Trump in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And now it just doesn't seem like that as much anymore. Yeah. Just it, when, when you're talking to people? Just when I'm talking to people, even mm -hmm. the sentiment on Twitter, you know, like for sure. I post, posted a tweet a few weeks ago where I said, oh, I talked to the president for a few minutes or something like that. If I had done that three, four years ago, I would have had probably 50,000 people unfollow me. Right. I didn't lose any followers. Right. That to me is mm. an indication of some kind of sentiment. Now, yeah. what that is, I don't know. Now, you still got people who went absolutely crazy about that, sure. but uh, it just doesn't seem to be the way it was. Yeah. I knew people who had no business in politics vote for Joe Biden in 2020. And this is what I argued to Bannon when he was like, it was rigged, it was stolen. And I was like, no. yo, when I saw my skateboarder friend film a video of himself dropping his mail in bout saying, we got to vote for Biden, I was like, oh, wow, Trump lost. Skateboarders notoriously don't care about anything. Notoriously will live in a studio apartment with 10 people paying 50 bucks a month if it means they have to work less so they can skate more. And here's a guy who's like in his late 20s being like, I'm doing my part and voting for Joe Biden. And I was like, wow, now that's mobilization. So I, today I don't see it. Today, a lot of these people are now saying like, yeah, that was a mistake. I've talked to some people and family members. They're like, I should not have voted for Joe Biden. 
A lot of people saying they regret it. I was hanging out at the poker tables uh, a couple weeks ago, and one guy said, I voted for Biden in 2020. Boy, was that a mistake. I'll vote for Trump now. And I'm like, really? I was like, you a liberal conservative guy? And he's like, neither. I don't know. I just voted for Biden. Shouldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's true at scale, but every single person that I know that hated Trump in 2016 hates him more now. Like they're they're way gone. All of them. Wait, every I can't think of one single person that I know, in my family, in my circle of friends, my friends' friends. Not one person that I know uh, has become uh, interested in the idea of Trump. They hate him more. You see, I, this is anecdotal, so I mean, right. I, I don't know. I mean, mine is anecdotal too. Mine is that I know. I, there, I, there are a couple people I know who just got more intense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 they're gone. There's no bringing them back. But a lot of people I know who identify as like either moderate or lean left. You know, they were going to vote for Biden before, but now they're like, well, I'm going to vote for Biden. Like, mm, the enthusiasm mm. has gone out of right. it, right? There isn't the same level of, like, we have to vote for Biden because we absolutely can't be Trump. They're like, well, I registered as a Democrat, so I should support that guy. But it's, again, like I said, there's no love for Biden. People aren't saying we really believe in his leadership. We really believe in his vision for the country. We, we, we know he will not trip upstairs again. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. there's nothing about Biden's appealing except for the fact that they think they should be voting for him. Uh, and I think to that sense that that complete irrational anger for some people has subsided maybe not for everyone right. but i think it's we'll changed. see i mean I, we'll, we'll find out let's grab this one last segment from the post millennial california moves to create genealogy office to determine who gets reparations ah yes we're going to track your genetics <laughs> to figure out if you are the descendant of a free black person living in the united states uh prior to the end of the 19th century can I just say it? Like, is anyone who's African American like, yes, U.S. government, we want to register with you? Like, that seems bad. <laughs> that seems not good. Yeah. To be yeah, like, but... please submit your genetic identity to the government. The no, California no. California Senate Judiciary Committee has approved legislation that would establish a new cabinet level agency tasked with carrying out the state reparation task force's recommendations. The California American Freedmen's Affairs Agency would be headed by a secretary appointed by the governor. And among other things, create a genealogy office to help determine who is eligible to receive as much as $1.2 million to make up for the injustices committed against their ancestors per just the news. Absolutely amazing. (laughs) I, uh, we were, we were talking on the culture war and I said, why don't we just give the federal, like all this West coast federal land as reparations? Why not? The federal government has seized a whole bunch of land is going unused. A lot of the land is being sold to China. Okay, here's here here you go. Reparations solved. Everybody here's forty acres. And that will strip the federal government of a lot of its land ownership. Give it to American citizens. Granted, it's a compromise. I'm not a big fan of the racial division stuff, but you know, there'll be a lot of white people who get it because they're descendants of slaves as well, because you, you get this far down the line and there's gonna be a guy who's white but does have a grandmother who was a slave or something. And I'm just like, take the land from the federal government, see if I care. Yeah, the federal government's their power. not going to give it up, though, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, California could give away state land, and instead they're like, send us your genetic information, <laughs> and we'll make another bureaucratic agency and help you out with taxpayer money. Like, I think you're right. There could be a simpler solution. Instead, they're like, more private information. That's what we need to solve this problem. But, I mean, of course, their perspective is like, oh, no, no, we're not giving you anything. You guys are going to give each other <laughs> what we say that you're going to Yeah, get. you're right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's, Way too logical. It seems not positive at all. Yeah. And of course, the government is malevolent, you know, at, at the state and local level. So, you know. You don't I, think I, I going to solve this? <sighs> it's, a, it's the enclave. That's how I view it for those that are fans of Fallout. It is a group of powerful individuals and they've separated themselves from the system and they're just doing whatever they want at this point. Hmm. I don't know that. And they know it. how to use the power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. They I mean, use the power. People just fall in line. And that's all that that's all that matters for him, I guess. People will will do whatever the government tells them to do. Trump supporters, conservatives will back the blue. We had uh, we, we, we've talked about how CBP is facilitating child sex slavery. And we've had people on the come, come on this show and say, yes, yeah, so what? And I'm like, well, it's not it's not it's not the officer's fault. It's the it's the president's fault. And I'm like, nah, it's the guy who's transferring children into sex slavery's fault. But this is why I am surprised that they would even propose archiving like a minority group's genetic material, right? Like, why would anyone be okay with this unless you think you're really going to get something out of it? And also, when has California ever delivered on these promises, right? It seems way oh, yeah. more dangerous to the people involved, 
you know, they're putting a lot of private information at risk, especially if you use, I don't know, state health insurance. Like there are all kinds of problems with this. And instead they're dangling this sort of big payday out. I, I think only the government benefits from this. And I don't think anyone who honestly thinks that they could get government money from this will we'll see a dime this is a state i just had to look up the figure because it's changed they've already squandered 10 billion dollars on a speed rail that is never going to happen oh yeah but reparations like, are on their way don't right. worry <laughs> just yeah. register with your race to the federal or to the state right. government and we'll figure it out for and you. i'm being serious like this is yeah. one of the things like if you have you know your genetic uh, information could tell that you had a pre-existing condition. Could the state then say like, oh, well, now you don't qualify for this type of health insurance or now we're going to do this or raise a specific tax? Like, why would you give them any more information to levy, levy against you? Like, especially when none of the money ever comes from any of these things. Just seems seems very dangerous to me. What I don't understand, it says descendants of a free black person living in the U.S. prior to the end of the 19th century. So, so you can't like have uh, immigrated here from you know, any African country and then claim the money. Well, it's so if your ancestor was a slave in the year 1900, because, for you know, they were still never released, then you don't get anything. None for them. None for them. But uh, well, you got to draw the line somewhere. I mean, <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is it's not made of endless money. We're California. <laughs> this, this means that immigrants who came here in 1899 who were black and had kids. The, but they were never slaves is the argument. So right. They wouldn't qualify no they would a free black person living in the u.s prior to the end of the 19th century it initially stated they had to mm -hmm. be chattel enslaved person now they're saying a free black person prior to the 19th so uh, now more people qualify qualify for reparations this right. seems worse this seems like I, I again i don't understand what problem they think they're solving other than potentially making again a minority group of people give them sensitive information which I would be on high alert for it. That sounds bad. But who, who am I to judge California and the all-knowing Governor Gavin Newsom? He's doing a great job, I heard. No, they <laughs> say that California is five years uh, uh, ahead of the rest of the country and that what happens in California eventually does hit the rest of the country, though I think that's changed with the MAGA movement. I think this is, I think Trump and Trump supporters is like the first time there's been a counter to the left abuse of power and expansion of cultural authority. Mm. And that's why they're really freaking out. Republicans are the Washington generals to the Democrats, Harlem Globetrotters. MAGA comes along and all of a sudden you've got Washington generals dunking and actually winning and the Globetrotters are getting pissed. Being like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing this. We got to get these players out of here. It's ruining the show. Mm. But, you know, that's the trajectory of, trajectory of things. And uh, short of some shadow campaign, I don't know, Trump wins. Do you think we'd ever get a Harlem Globetrotter to come on this show? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> but what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? Do you think, you think Trump wins? I get concerned with how much it looks like he is winning to the extent that you want mm. Trump to win. It's almost like, how is he so far ahead? Do you and think people are going to get complacent because they feel like it's in the bag? I think so. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember, but in January of 2020, was it 2020 or January 2019? Yeah, January 2019. Remember how on top of the world he was? Mm -hmm. you know, he was, <laughs> right? He was and so untouchable. Mm -hmm, every, right? Everybody I was meeting was saying they made more money in 2019 than the, at any point in their lives. Insane. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so now you got him up in all these polls and whatnot. And But who knows? Who knows? Like you said, it's going to be a long battle to to November. <laughs> when we were, we were building out our first studio for IRL, it was the uh, beginning of January 2020. And uh, I went to a furniture store and I was like, we just need a table and chairs because I don't know what we're doing. And uh, I spent like five grand on buying all this stuff. And the lady was like, this is amazing. And she was super excited. And she's like, thank you so much. You, I walked in the front door, I said, I want it. And she was like, really? Like, just like that? And uh, she said, you know, this last year I made more money than I ever have in my life. Mm -hmm. It was the best year. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And inflation was low. Yeah. And then uh, we had a guy doing landscaping. And he said the same things. My company's been booming. He's like, we've 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 never made so much money before. This has been fantastic. Hiring, expanding. And I was like, this is awesome. And then March came and everything. But think about it. So awesome. Think about how low inflation was, right? When interest mm -hmm. rates were so low. I mean, that was really, in my opinion, uh, the magic sauce. You know, yeah. I'm was, in business day to day, and you look at what happened starting in 2020 with these cost of goods sold. You know, the the inputs, the cost, of the inputs. I mean, people were just not making as much money anymore. Not just because of Trump and stuff, I think, but or to the extent that you mm -hmm. think that Trump wasn't responsible, you know, help lower inflation. But it's not just earning more money; it's also stuff costing you less. Yeah, right. I wonder if we get World War Three before November. 
I feel like the Democrats would certainly prefer it. They need they need anything. It's mutually assured destruction, though, don't you think? Yeah, but I kind of feel like if you're facing prison when Donald Trump sends the DOJ into your state to start ripping through the corruption, you're you're going to sink the whole ship. You think he will use the DOJ this time? Uh, I'm hopeful. I lean slightly towards I think it's more likely, especially with people like Cash Patel. So, you know what I think Trump did in his first term was he tried to play ball. I remember I was in D.C. around this uh, around his, you know, when he became the front runner for the for the Republicans. He had this meeting and, you know, I'm, we're hanging out. Me and some other journalists are outside this building. I'm like, oh, Trump's inside talking with the Republicans. I bet he sat down and said, look, I'm going to be the nominee. We're going to work together on this one. Let me know what you need. And I think what happens is Trump gets in thinking, I'm the president. Now I can do things. And the deep state slides the folder saying, here's what you're going to do. And he goes, no, we can't do that. That's a bad idea. And they're like, well, you have to. And he says, no, look, I promise we'd get our troops out of the Middle East. We're getting our troops out of the Middle East. And they said, you cannot do that. And he said, well, I'm the president, so I will. And then he leaves the meeting and the deep state goes, he's got to go. And that and that was it. Trump made the mistake of bringing on a bunch of people he should not have brought on because he thought he was playing ball. And then they stabbed him in the back. I think this time around, especially with these criminal trials, Trump may not be the guy people want him to be, this paladin with a hammer smashing the, the, the corruption. But he, he'll likely bring on some better people. Uh, Cash Patel, of course, we've talked to him and, you know, we'll see where he ends up. But uh, I think second time around, he's going to bring on people who just say it's time to to clean this, clean this mess up. I'm looking and then you got to clean up the local prosecutors, too. Yep. And that's and that's on everybody else, you know. So we've got to, We've got to do our work in Berkeley County over in West Virginia because they allow uh, child drag shows. Jefferson County, West Virginia does not. They outright banned it. But the, uh, my understanding is that the, uh, what did they do? They, they, they did something recently with, um, they, Charlestown, West Virginia, which is like the nearest city to us. One of them. There's also Frederick. They had some kind of like declaration of LGBT pride month or something. And I'm like in, in Jefferson County, West Virginia, Charlestown, like what happened in, I was talking to a guy who was a council member and he said, yeah, the city council is dominated by Democrats. And I'm like, how? And he's like, uh, conservatives don't vote. I'm like, you have a conservative town in one of the most Trump supporting states, second most Trump supporting state in the country, where all of the Christians from a Latin mass went out like a thousand people protesting and they don't vote. Like, yeah, they don't vote. Hmm. So the city council is uh, dominated by woke far leftists who do whatever they want because the right does not organize. They do not vote. Hmm. So then you have Berkeley County where right next to our building where we're setting up our Cass Brew Coffee location, they had a drag show in the street with children on stage. And I complained to government and they were like, we can't believe this is happening. But even though it is illegal in West Virginia, you know, the prosecutor in Berkeley County doesn't care. They, they allow it. it. It is a violation of West Virginia law to do what they did unquestionably. Jefferson County passed an ordinance outright saying like, yeah, you can't do that. No, no child drag shows. And then in uh, Berkeley County, which is just west, they were just like, "Yeah, we don't care." Wow. Yeah, totally allowed. But so that means you have to be active on every level of government, right? Like it's not yep. enough to get the state legislature; you need to be in your local, you know, county, every like everywhere. And, and worse still, in Jefferson County, you've got woke far leftists running for school board, getting into these schools, and then bringing in gratuitous sex content to give to children, and then the kids aren't telling their parents or don't know and the parents don't ask so you've got weird pedo cultists coming in to conservative areas and infiltrating schools and the conservative parents have no idea and then one day i hear from a parent they're like my kid came home and said that they were you know pan or something and it's like your 10 year old does not know what that means and they're like we know but how is this getting into our schools and i'm like are you going to your school board meetings i'm like no there you go. It's wild to me, this idea that parents are like, I have a child. Let's hand them off to the state. I have no idea who these people are, but mm -hmm. here you go. Good luck, I guess. These strangers have no political agenda. They only want what's best for everyone. Sure. I was talking to a, a, one of our, a friend of ours. don't even have kids. No, a yeah. lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. One of our friends Many has of them got- hate having kids. And they don't want you to have kids. Yeah. So one, one of our friends has uh, several kids and he's talking about 
his kids are now at school age and he's sending, sending them to school. But he was like, it's kind of weird. We don't know if we want to do it. It's like this idea that, well, we've had you for six years, but now we're going to hand you off and never, and, and we're going to see you only a third of the time or something. That seems like a terrible idea. I think they're homeschooling now. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, homeschooling's not a joke. It's a lot of work. On the other hand, public schools, you really don't know, right? Like it, Maybe you might know if you live in a really small town, all the elementary school teachers, if you're, you know, if your kid's in a really tiny school. But mm -hmm. as they go through the system, the idea that you really know, have a social interaction with, go to the same church, use the same grocery store as a teacher in your kid's school becomes smaller and smaller. There's, we have our kids strangers. in a Catholic grade school, and that's been the best thing that's happened because mm -hmm. it's kind of locked down. You lock down with all the teachers. Mm -hmm. You know who's going in. You know who's going out. And then some of our other friends, you know, they're at public schools. That they have no clue who's going in and out of these things. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying Catholic schools are the answer. I'm just saying it's, uh, you know, you try to do whatever you can to protect them. Yeah. I, I mean, the people who suffer the most are the people who don't have other options, right? If you can't afford I to agree. enroll your kid in private school or you don't have the time or resources to homeschool, you're stuck. You are obligated to send your kid to school. So you have to trust that somebody on your school board shares your values. And it's just, it's an awful situation. I'm going to, I'm just going to offend as many people as I can. Uh, Super dude says, Tim's talking mad ish for someone with no kids. Pilgrim says, Tim, most parents are busy at work. And, uh, a few other people saying similar thing. Tim doesn't have kids. Uh, but I will give a shout out to Keep Grinding saying Tim would be a good father. Thank you. Uh, look, man, I'm sorry. I get it. The system is broken. You're not supposed to give your kids away. That's never been how humans have raised their children. Yes, I get you're at work. That's not supposed to be what's happening. We have to actively resist that. Kids need to be around their parents and learn from their parents. This is how humanity has survived for, for eons. The children would learn from their parents. The, the, the blacksmith father would, would, his son would watch him work. And then when his son was old enough, he'd say, hey, hand me, hand me that bag of bolts over there. Bring them over here, son. And then as the kid got older, he'd be like, let me show you how to do this thing and do that thing. And the kid would grow up and be a master blacksmith. And then the father would get old and say, son, I think it's time you took over the shop and started a family of your own and, or started a family of your own well before he took over the shop. But then, you know, Graham, then he'd have kids. It is, it has been for Tens of thousands of years, children were raised by their parents. And then at the turn of the century in the 1900s, industrialization happened. And then all of a sudden it was like, now that you're going to a factory, your children will be taken from you and handed to the state. And this is good. Now we're in a society where it's the expectation and I have no choice. Well, I'm not saying it's easy, but you need to figure it out. And the parents aren't anywhere near... The father-in-law isn't anywhere near. The mother-in-law right. isn't anywhere yep, that's near. That's a big component of it. Nucleus. Yeah. I mean, I have an amazing mother-in-law. I mean, if I didn't have her, I mean, not only who would be these strangers who would help raise the kids, but I mean, what happened to that family nucleus? And right. now everybody right. can live everywhere and you can get on airplanes and stuff. It's like, I don't think we understand the damage that a lot of these benefits in our society have done. No, I totally agree. There are, I can't remember which country, but I think Eastern, a couple of Eastern European countries that offer tax credits or some yeah. kind of program to um, grandparents who will step in and, you know, offer childcare or whatever else. So, you know, they could say, like America says, oh, well, we'll cover preschool, we'll cover, we'll cover daycare. But we don't say, well, you should be able to have your kids stay with, you know, an aunt who stay at home or a grandparent who has the time is retired. Like yeah. instead of encouraging families to stay together, it's like, well, just separate more, get involved in the public education system even sooner. Right. That's that's a terrible way. To be. That's not my values. I think ultimately we want families to pull together and to be there for each other, no matter what that looks like. Well, speaking in very general terms, it's the millennial generation that has all these hangups about, you know, not having kids for the most part. And that's because we were raised by the most entitled generation that's ever existed, the boomers. And that, and I mean, and this is a trend that I see a lot, like boomers, they don't have that sense of uh, being a grandparent that I'm not talking about all boomers. Obviously, there's going to be plenty of outliers. I hope everybody that's listening, they're they're Boomer parents are great. Great grandparents. You're afraid the boomers are going to come after you? <laughs> boomers made Star Trek the next generation, so. I never they saw contributed. It. They contributed. They <laughs> contributed. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact is, is that boomers, they, they are the most entitled generation. They do not want to be there for their grandkids on at a, at a scale that most people, I mean, this is like a meme at this point. And when you when you have that breakup from the, the grandparents, it impacts their kids and it impacts their grandkids. And it's unfortunate, but that's how it is for a lot of people, I'm afraid. We're going to go to Super Chat, so if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends, and head over to TimCast.com, click join us to become a member, because this show is made possible thanks in part to viewers like you. In fact, mostly due to viewers like you. That's what funds the show. And I'll also add, you may have seen the news, we're being sued. So that's going to uh, cost money, 
And Speaking wanna, of lawfare is warfare. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you want to support us uh, as we define ourselves, just, you know, you become a member. And uh, YouTube, of course, has been crashing, as many people have been pointing out. Chat crashed and then reignited. So not much we can do there. But let's read your super chats. Clint Torres says, howdy, people. Howdy, Clint. Always with the first super chat. Uh, Matthew Evans says, can Bill talk about what he is doing in St. Louis? Are you doing something in St. Louis? Yeah, we went into some of the worst areas for crime, and we went and demolished a bunch of homes. I don't know if you saw that. De homes, meaning decrepit homes, abandoned homes, cleaned up the neighborhoods, uh, got it to look beautiful again. So going into inner city neighborhoods in America and cleaning them up. Right on. I actually did that with, of all people, believe it or not, Jack Dorsey. Wow. Yeah, I know that was kind of crazy to think of. Talk about two different people, yeah. him and me, but uh, he funded it, so that was very nice of him. Cool. Normies get out uh, 49 months, a member. Wow. Is that for real? I didn't even know that was possible. How long have we been doing this show for? He says it's all so tiresome. Often it is. It is. Mad Max says, Piers Morgan believes Trump going to Barron's graduation and going to jail for it would guarantee a landslide victory in November. A lot of people have said that to me. Uh, I was talking to one guy earlier and I said, I didn't know. I don't know that Trump going to jail will get him a victory. And this is an apolitical guy. He's like, I don't know. I feel like if they arrested Trump for that, he just win and i was like really you think so it's like i i don't i don't know that it guarantees it i don't all right zaronis says new conspiracy theory after losing the american civil war democrats swore they would destroy america even if even if it took them 150 years or more to do so yeah jay kesey says tim wore a different shirt <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a shirt that pulte gave me thank you yeah yeah it's got the x philanthropy on it right there you can see I knew this would be a sign of end times for some people. Tim Tim changes his his uh, outfit. That doesn't this happen often. No, he's pretty consistent what he wears. But you picked his, his uh, favorite color, I think, or at least for clothing black. Yeah. So for the people in the chat that are saying we lost viewers, we didn't actually lose the viewers. The chat and the view count is broken on YouTube, and this this happens periodically. But I would not be surprised if YouTube is actively screwing with us as. You know, yeah, probably, you know, it is what it is throughout the show. Hey, it's an election year. It's going to be fun. So uh, make sure you share the show with your friends and become a member at TimCast.com. Let's go. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, seriously, Bloodbath is one of the best nicknames. <laughs> yep. Chris Bloodbath Carr. He had it first. Donald you Trump's You started this nonsense. <laughs> what are you talking about? That was always your nickname. Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Nicholas says, how much did Trump pay you to push truth social stock? It's failing miserably. And I got to be honest, I was actually surprised by that. And the reason was, I did not think anyone actually bought the stock thinking the company made sense. So when the stock was being purchased, it seemed to me that Trump supporters were just buying it. So I have uh, around 10 or so shares. Uh, that's right, 10, um, because they're like collectibles. I was like, ooh, I'd like to have a, some. I, I did not invest any kind of uh, substantive, but I was surprised. I didn't think that would happen. I thought that uh, Trump supporters were uh, basically just buying it up because they liked Trump. As it turns out, I was wrong. And it was actually investors who were buying Trump truth social stock, which surprised me because I, I agreed with the Krasensteins when they said, does anyone really think that this company is worth this? And I'm like, yeah, the people who are buying it are just Trump fans. I agree. But then, uh, no, it turns out the Krasensteins and I were both wrong. Actual investors bought stock and then, and then dumped it. Wow. That surprised the heck out of me. What more can I say? Oh, let's, uh, let's grab some more Super Chats here. Mega Mikey says, do we have any updates regarding the whistleblower that exposed NPR's woke takeover in the New York Post article? It was the free press article, actually. I heard NPR just suspended the whistleblower today. That is correct. Mm -hmm. I, believe, I believe they fired him, right? Suspended for five days uh, oh. as, of, as of our reporting. That's what I read. Oh, that's it? Yeah. A little slap on the wrist. Yeah. And they, they said that it was because he published in another outlet without clearing it through them. That's, right. That's what they said. <laughs> They didn't deny any of his claims. <laughs> yeah. They're like, it's true. We are pretty far gone. But anyways. But it's funny that the uh, the woman who runs it, she was like, why are people calling me a Biden supporter? And there's a picture of her wearing a Biden hat. <laughs> Biden hat and, and a mask. Yeah. yeah. She's like, you can't prove anything. And then the prosecutor who's been arguing at the Supreme Court is like, look, it's true. You, we don't know. X Tin Man says you should get together with a local brewery and make an Appalachian Nights coffee stout. Yes. 
We could. Yeah, we we talked with one brewery about uh, uh, having our own our own brew. It's just, I don't know. It's a, it's it's not a huge priority for us. The one thing that we did want to do is cast brew cold brew cans, but that's uh that's that we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. Flying Dog Brewery, which I think is in Maryland, used to use um Black Dog. Uh, or Black Dog Coffee, which is local for their mm. coffee, which I always think is cool. It's cool oh, to nice. see those kind of local collaborations. Right on. Not a Doc says, first Ryan Cohen with Javier Malay. And now this, small world, big wins, diamond hands. Now I just need Phil on unsubscribe podcast. Well, there you go. What do we got here? Jimbo says, Pulte 2024. And then he says, what is this? Jimbo 0341 for that 1000. Are you going to run for office? We'll see. That was a long pause. He's gonna <laughs> run. Yep. Paul Tascolo says the New York court can issue a bench warrant to Trump, which compels him to be, uh, to be present in the New York courtroom. It wouldn't send him to jail. And what happens if he defies that bench warrant and says no? Can he Skype in? Like, could he zoom into this or does he have to physically be there? I think that's it. He has to physically be there. That's that my seems understanding. very yeah. rude. He should be able to like Skype call in from Barron's graduation. Yeah, it's a punishment. Just political BS says any attempt by New York City to arrest Trump or take his property while the Secret Service, uh, while his Secret Service is flawed, anywhere his Secret Service is automatically designated federal ground superseding any local, they would be outside their purview. Hmm. I don't Rob know. says, Tim, what's your take on Agenda 2025? I see a lot of leftists ranting and raving about it. No, what is that? What is what is that? I'm not a leftist, so I don't really about it. It's essentially a very long document that was put together by a, a policy, a bunch of policymakers that are going to that are saying that this policy is going to be Trump's policy moving forward. It's very long. I mean, it's it's basically from a conservative think tank. From a, you know a brief glance at it, it's very long, a lot of pages, and they're just they're claiming that basically Trump is going to make the most far right wing policies that they could possibly imagine. And Trump has not said, yes, this is the plan. Like, what is I, the connection? I can't think of a, of a moment when he's referenced uh, the, this thing that the people on TikTok are, you know, decrying. Yeah. Uh, but I did look into it and I did look over the document. I mean, it's just it's from a think tank, basically. Do you think it's like more radical than people are surprised? Like, or no. is it just like kind of whipping outrage? Uh, I think it's whipping outrage. From what I saw, it was it was pretty, I mean, moderate conservative at the best. Like, yeah. it didn't have anything uh, alarming in it that I saw. So don't worry, leftist. Chris Carr, executive editor, says it's fine. Bloodbath. Bloodbath. But bloodbath Carr. I apologize. How <laughs> can I not your use source. your correct pronouns? <laughs> King Apollyon X says, hey, Tim, I don't think cops can actually justify arresting Trump because I need to support my family. If cops were fired, they could easily get donations from Trump supporters to support themselves. That's true for every single cop who uh, ever did something wrong. And for some reason, they don't do it. Like the cops who arrested Daniel Penny and the cops who escorted him to and from court. The, uh, the cops who arrested the Proud Boys, any one of them could have said, I refuse, but they don't because they don't care. This is a fascinating thing to me is that people assume cops are conservatives and it's like they've never actually gone to New York City and talked to a cop because they're all just like middle of the road, moderate Democrat leaning people because they live in New York City. Doesn't matter if they're cops or not. They don't know or care. They just want to go home and watch the game. All right. Jake Swift says, my girlfriend is in law school and said that most judges are previous prosecutors and DAs, which makes no sense. Innocent until proven guilty. We need more defense judges. Where is true justice? Yep. And the DAs and the justices and the, and the judges know each other and they've worked together. So what are you going to do? It's a flawed system, I guess. It's better than a lot of systems, but it's breaking apart. Jacob Hawley says, the United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Means are important as ends. Crisis makes it tempting to ignore the wise restraints that make men free. Agreed. Yes, the ends do not justify the means because you will never meet the end. Or, uh, you will never meet the ends. Or, uh, yeah, right. The idea being that these communist revolutionaries are all like, well, if we execute all these people, then we'll get our revolution and then we'll get our beautiful country. And then once they take over, they say, we are still fighting to maintain the country. There, there is no end. Have, there, there's no point at which you're like, hey, we're done. And then you sit down and, and just stare at your abundance of food and never have to work again. You are life is a treadmill and you are going to be running on it forever until you die. And then your kids will run on it. And there you go. 
OMG Puppy says the cops didn't arrest the Proud Boys. De Blasio's DA reopened the case weeks later to get them. And who do you think got them? And who do you think brought them in? And who do you think held them in cages? The, 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 the DA did it all. The DA showed up in a suit with leather gloves and was like, the, the police have refused. So I'm taking you in, Proud Boys. Yeah, no, the Proud Boys went to the police, told the police everything. If the Proud Boys did not talk to the cops, they wouldn't have got arrested. The DA would have said, who were those guys? And the cops have said, we have no idea. The cops cooperated every step of the way, told the DA everything he wanted to know so that he could hunt these people down and put them in prison. That's not a hard concept, is it? Let's go. James Eaton says the courts are corrupt. Why follow the law? No, 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 no. I respect following the law within reason. Just because it is law doesn't mean it's good. What the Nazis were doing was law and it was not good. However, the issue right now is that they're not following the law. The charges against Trump are not legal. They made it up. They just made it up. And they do that in New York during Occupy Wall Street. It was really funny because they'd uh, the cops would point at the ground and go, that's frozen. You can't stand there. They, that's what they would do. They would call them frozen zones. A made up concept that didn't exist legally anywhere. And this and this, the police would just be like, we hereby have frozen this block. It's like, what does that mean? It's a frozen zone. You can't stand there. That's not a thing. And they would do that. You'd be standing next to someone and be like, uh, you're in a frozen zone, so you have to move. You'd be like, what? And be like, we'll arrest you if you don't. They they shut down portions of the city during Occupy, and you could only get through if you had proof, you had business or for some reason to be on those blocks, which is crazy. Because I'd like, uh, I knew this guy who lived near uh, the park, and the cops would block the street. And if I went, I'm going to my friend's house, they'd be like, no, you're not. You got to show us an ID or a piece of mail or something proving. Get your friend, have him come pick you up. And I'm like, that's insane. This is a public street. I'm just trying to walk over to that building. No. Nope. In your mind, what happened to Occupy Wall Street? Uh, I got taken over by activist organizations because I I, I, I do blame partly, uh, I, you know, to like a certain degree, I blame Steve Bannon. Not, not like directly, but uh, a lot of these like populist right wing and Tea Party people fell for Fox News and Fox News gleefully smeared Occupy. When I was at Occupy Wall Street, when I was first there, it was libertarian, conservative, Democrat. It was just left, right, populist. Everybody was mad at big banks. Everybody was mad at Obama. And then Hannity and other Fox News personalities go on TV and they say, it's a bunch of lefties. It's left, left, left. They're bad. And so then what happens is after the first weekend, when the conservatives who were there decided to go to work, leftist NGOs, paid staff showed up and said, we're going to start organizing now. And people like, you know, Bannon and the Breitbart crew were like, screw those hippie lefties. We're not getting involved in that. I told Bannon this. I said, if you had showed up, shown up the first weekend to Occupy Wall Street, they would have been clapping and cheering for you the whole time. It would have kept the conservatives and libertarians there, would have created a united populist front. Instead, what was born out of anger over the banking bailouts was taken over by NGO activists who began pushing critical race theory and intersectionality. And it pushed out everybody else. I knew one guy who was an anarchist. He wasn't like a left, he's just an anarchist, just, you know, hey, no government. And uh, it was so fascinating. They had something called the General Assembly. Everybody would gather around and they would try to buy things with donations. And it was direct democracy. Everybody would either agree with twi twinkle fingers. And this is what happens when conservatives don't show up. The far left activists turn it into a twinkle finger, twinkle finger party. And, uh, the people who controlled the money didn't like how things were going because it was very hard to spend things. The, the, the example I love is when it would rain, the clothing and the supplies would get destroyed. So someone said, we need plastic bins to store them in. So they go to a general assembly meeting and someone says, I propose we buy bins to store our, our blankets and clothes and extra stuff in so the rain doesn't destroy them. All in favor. Everybody wiggles their fingers. A few people put up what's called a block. Hard block must be adjudicated. You, you, what is the block for? And someone said, plastic destroys the environment. We cannot do that. And then they debated it. And someone said, okay, what if it's recycled? They said, okay, well, if you're recycling, that's good, I guess. Right, right. It, or, it already exists, so we'll buy recycled used. Okay, agreed. And then someone raised block. What, what, what is it now? Yes, but did it originate fair trade? What, what, was this product made by exploitation? Because if it is, it should be destroyed. Okay. So we will buy bins that are recycled and fair trade. Well, that's impossible. You can't find them. So what did they do? They went to Walmart and bought bins. They, they ignored the will of the people. So they tried creating something called the Spokes Council that would segment everything into a few delegates from different pockets. 
So if you worked in the sanitation team, you'd send one representative to the spokes council to speak on your behalf. The only problem with that is that instead of making the vote based on the work you did, like computers or sanitation or food, they added race and gender. So they made the black, the Mexican, the Asian. There was no white group. Then they made the women's caucus. But then there were problems because some women didn't want trans people in the women's caucus. So they created two women's caucuses, the the women's with no trans and the women's trans. And then people the were turf. Group. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't call them a turf group <laughs> because joking. they were. But then what ended up happening was you had these groups all voting on how to spend money based on their race or gender, wow. which clearly doesn't make sense. I think uh, the best way to explain it is there's this comic where this rich guy says, send in uh, identity politics. It's like a bunch of people with protest signs outside of a building. And then he's on the phone and he says, introduce them to identity politics. And that was it. All of these people were complaining about how our taxes were being ripped off. And it's funny to me how how easily the conservatives were played like fiddles by Fox News. They So the, the Occupy had, I am the 99%. And then you got this rebuttal from the right. I am the 47%. The fascinating thing is I met Luke Rudkowski at Occupy Wall Street. He's a libertarian. He's an anarch- well, he's an anarchist. And so you have an eclectic bunch of people of varying political ideologies angry at the federal government for stealing taxpayer dollars. And the people who watch Fox News marched in lockstep to denounce it instead of joining in. And if they did, they probably would have won. It probably would have been massive political change and upheaval in this country. But instead, the likes of Breitbart, the Tea Party, ignored and insulted it. Hannity made fun of them every single day. People, you know, the funny thing is when the when the networks brought people on to talk about it, they made sure only far leftists were brought in to uh, uh, to speak about what Occupy was. So instead of getting the 65 year old guy waving the American flag, they brought in the 23 year old college student to say, I, I deserve free stuff. And Fox News would do that. Imagine what would happen if Fox News brought in a 65-year-old guy with white hair and sunglasses with an American flag being Barack Obama ripped us off, bailed out these banks, and it's his fault. That would have been a very different narrative for Occupy Wall Street. But I don't know. Fox probably wanted the ratings. I don't like Fox News as it is. We'll read some more Super Chats here. Delaware X says- Fascinating. I mean, that's not something that's very talked about. What, oh, ha- what happened with Occupy Wall Street? Oh, the, the, what, I, what, I, what I love so much about it is that the, uh, the history of Occupy is all fake because the people who wrote books about it romanticize and lie to push their narrative. And it's just absolutely fascinating. I mean, it was abject corruption at Occupy the entire time. There were people who lived in the park as part of the protest who had buckets and were raising money. The NGOs and the Brooklyn College students who didn't live in the park put out messages and flyers saying, do not give these people money. They're not Occupy Wall Street because they wanted to control the flow of money. Mm. So when people online raise donations, which who controls Occupy? Nobody does. It was it was a week. People sleeping in a park and there were various people raising money for various things they wanted to buy. One group online was like, we're going to buy stuff. And so they started telling everyone those are that's a scam. That, that's not us. It's a scam. We're in charge. And then I'm talking, I'm like, you're not in charge. You're just some random dude who's asking for money. They're asking for money too. They put up signs saying, do not give. If anyone asks you for money, don't give it to them. Only give it to us. It was just super corrupt. It got to the point where the people who lived in the park, they called themselves the general union and they opposed the general assembly. And then when the general union, which was the west side of the park, wanted to have a meeting, NGO staffers sent guys to threaten violence against them. And one of the dudes started crying. It was wild. And so I met these guys because I was filming and they were like, hey, we're going to have a meeting because they're they're telling everybody that we're scammers. And we, we actually sleep in the park. They don't. They're like rich college kids and trust fund kids and like people who work for nonprofits. And I'm like, cool, I'll film it. And when they had the meeting, quote unquote, facilitators, they called themselves, showed up and they do their cult thing. It's so brilliant how they've mind warped people. When someone said, we're here to have a meeting about spending. Facilitators walked up and went, Mike, check. Everyone yells, Mike, check. When any time anyone who opposed them tried to speak, they would yell, Mike, check. And everyone would just repeat it, shutting down the conversation because it's a cult. That's what they do. Yeah, Occupy was wild. And then they go, two pools live. That never happened. Actually, The Daily Show did a segment about this where they talked about the divide from the East and the West, the rich and the poor. So the people who organized Occupy have a vested interest in lying and pretending these things work to advance their political ideology when they don't actually work. 
All right, we'll grab some more Super Chats. Triton54 says, if Trump fails to attend the SCOTUS hearing, it will communicate he'd rather complain about corruption rather than challenge it. Second term will be the same as the first. He'll lose my vote. Yeah, I wonder. I, I feel that for sure. If Trump is unwilling to go to the Supreme Court to defend the, uh, the, the presidency and this country, and instead he goes, well, the judge told me he'll put me in jail. That says to me that Trump fears jail more than the collapse of this country. That's why I'm like, Trump has to go to the Supreme Court. He has no choice. This is, this is a question of the president's authority in their official duties. And this judge is saying, I'll hold you in contempt to go to jail for 30 days. So what's scary to Trump? The, the, the end <clears throat> of the executive branch and the fabric of this nation or 30 days in jail? If Trump skips SCOTUS, it shows that he's worried more about his personal comfort than he is about this country. It's tough. It's, it's a tough position, I suppose. I don't know what to tell you. All right, let's just grab a couple more. Eldritch Nader says, hey, Tim, they're 2020 electioning your views. They are. But notice the, the rate of chat. It's not an easy verb, 2020 electioning. <laughs> yeah, but also just so you guys know, like this thing with view count happens. Yeah, a couple times a year. Like you, the chat crashed and then uh, YouTube has problems. So yeah, it is what it is. We can see in the back end that everything's remained actually fairly normal. Uh, while it's displaying 488 viewers right now, I can see on the back end that we're probably at like, I don't know, 35 thousand we were at like 38 at the peak of the show i'm not i'm not super worried about youtube uh oh look at this amateur says youtube is being hacked down detector listing 10,000 issues interesting wow. hmm. drew badly says youtube pushed an update a couple hours ago and they broke it for peak evening hours intentional or not big l move this happens all the time that's youtube man oh look at this someone said they were unsubscribed by force what's likely happening is that youtube broke they do this like I said, it happens a couple times a year yeah. and then you'll wake up tomorrow and it'll be like, you won't even notice. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a political move too. Like the idea is shake some uh, uh, subscribers off by force and then people will just, you know, casual viewers will stop getting the, the notifications and stop watching. I'm not super worried about it though. What you can do right now if you are concerned is smash the like button, uh, subscribe to this channel, share the show with your friends. Head over to TimCast.com because we're going to have that members only show coming up. And uh, we usually do about 4,000 people on the members only show too. So we can easily track the numbers and, and all that stuff because we, we, use, we use Rumble for the members only show at TimCast.com. You can follow the show at TimCast IRL. You can follow me personally at TimCast. Pulte, do you want to shout anything out? Sure. At Pulte on Twitter. Thanks for having me, Tim. There you Pleasure. go. Right on. It's been really fun having you here. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hannah Claire Brimlow. I'm a writer for SCNR. That's Scanner News. I'm really grateful to be a part of that team. Um, you can follow all of our work at Timcast News on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow me personally on Twitter at HC Brimlow or on Instagram at handcler.b. Carter Banks, the music producer at Trash House, asked me to say happy birthday to his dad. So happy birthday, Mr. Banks. And I'm nice. so glad that you could be here tonight, Chris Carr. Exactly. It's always a pleasure. Sorry, Chris Bloodbath Carr. Thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure. Chris Carr 17 on X. And uh, as always, go to scnr.com for all of your news junkie needs. Serge? Uh, yeah, thanks for coming, Chris. Um, yeah, this YouTube thing, just so everyone knows, is actually going on for like everyone, like Moist Critical and stuff are having the same problem right now. So it's definitely something it's an update. Trend. I also yeah. want to stress this. So uh, we have a 30 second commercial where it's just me saying, hey, if you want to watch a show on culture, news and politics, Monday through Friday, live 8 p.m., subscribe to Timcast IRL. They called it an election ad. It is not. So I challenged it. It gets denied. So I create a new ad and I'm like, let's try again. They call it an election ad. I challenge it. It gets denied. I escalate it to a human and they say, this is strange. We've reviewed your commercial. It is not an election ad. Give us a second. A few minutes later, they come back to the chat and they're like, OK, we're going to have to get back to you on this one. I'm like, how very weird. And uh, then they eventually uh, emailed me finally today saying, we're so sorry we've approved the ad. It's literally just 30 seconds of me being like, watch Tim Cast IRL Monday through Friday, eight, you know, 8 p.m. Subscribe. Click here. That's all it is. A lot of people mention that they get unsubscribed from the channel. This is true, more so than most other channels. And you'll notice this is evidence, evident, uh, evidenced by, take a look at the viewer count that we get for the live show and the, and the live episodes compared to other podcasts and the subscriber count, and then you can see it clearly in the chat. I know they do this. I think the strategy they have is 
unsubscribe as many people as possible from the channel so that casual viewers drop off and stop watching. The only problem is our audience is a dedicated audience that shares and watches the show all the time. And that's why we have so many messages and emails from people being like, I've been forced unscribed again for like the fifth time because people have chosen to watch the show. So it really must grind the gears of people at YouTube that whatever they've done in their system that inhibits us isn't as effective as the show is just good. Now, that being said, the reason why I bought the commercial is we don't really do marketing and never did. It's always been organic growth. And I've talked with other industry people in media, and they're like, if you did basic marketing on top of the fact that your show grew organically that fa this fast, you'd probably be one of the biggest shows outside of YouTube as well as YouTube. And I was like, okay, well, we'll try something. I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know. I'm not super concerned about it, but let's see what we can do. Um, all right, everybody, we're going to go to the members only show. So go to TimCast.com. It's going to be a lot of fun and we'll see you there.